the Safety Doc Podcast with author, radio host, and nationally recognized safety expert, Dr. David Perotti. Join us each week as we discuss the best and most bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. Follow Dr. Perotin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. And remember, the truth will keep you safe. Hey, everybody, it is your good friend, the Safety Dog, or Safety Dog, Swamp Dog. I just saw Swamp Dog, not the Safety Dog. It's like pigtail type thing going on here with my headphone cord. But uh, welcome, Swamp Dog Armory. Solitude Surfer, Jim McIntosh, um, and Robert Rivett, Harrison, Zippy, The Strange. So thank all of you for being here. And I have something special to share during intermission tonight. And that is a special intermission video compilation put together by our good friend of the show, Swamp Dog Armory. So it's already loaded, ready to go. A lot of fun, and I appreciate it. So nice headset. Well, thanks. I've had this online. <laughs> this thing's probably like five years old, um, but uh, it, it does. It actually works really well. Um, so yeah, I had an option. There's like there was like a version of this where it has it had LED lights. So you could like make the ends of it different colors. I'm like, well, I don't. I don't probably need to do that, <laughs> especially on like some of my university um, uh, lectures and stuff like that. Hey, Andrew. So I do have a channel. So. Um, if you go and look for this channel, <laughs> I don't I think it's this channel. It's just my name, right? Um, but it has, I don't know, like 70 subscribers or something, but it's not the only thing I post on that channel are my university lectures. So I've been a professor for 18 years or something like that. So, um, if you go there, you'll find a lot of lectures now without a syllabus and stuff like that, they're it doesn't make a lot of sense if you're kind of catching it cold, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of my university channel. So people kind of get them mixed up at times. They'll be like, they'll subscribe to it. There's another David Proden out there who's a professor in France and we actually cross into the same areas. Um, he's produced a lot more on, um, <laughs> like on Google scholar, like you bring up his name, David D Proden versus mine, David P like he's got his whole list. I've, I got, yeah, I've got some things, but so it's a good doppelganger. We kind of look a little bit alike too. And sometimes people will email me and they'll be like, hey, is, you know, whatever. And it's in France or French. And I'm like, I don't know, but it's this guy uh, right here. Uh, so it's a good guy. But one time I contacted him, I said, hey, like uh, periodically people email me. And um, should, what is, how do you want me to like respond to them? Like what email should I give them to say, hey, I think you meant this for this guy. So it's a good guy. It's a really good guy. Um, Appreciate it here. Make sure you hit the uh, thumbs up. So those are good from Swamp Dog. So I want to have Swamp Dog on the show very soon. Um, so Swamp Dog, you know how to contact me. I do. Two weeks from tonight, we do have a special guest on the show. He is a locksmith. Um, and I don't have anything more to share at this time. We've been working to put together the show. But if you've watched The Lockpicking Lawyer, it's not the lock picking lawyer, but it's going to be a little bit similar to that. Um, kind of like, hey, for basic like home security or like you want to lock up your bike and stuff like that. Like, here's what to do. Here's what happens when you call locksmith. Uh, here's ways to keep yourself, you know, safe and stuff like that. So he approached me um, a few weeks ago and said, hey, I think this would be a great show. And we've since like kind of developed it. This is, you know, his full time thing. He has this, you know, he's a locksmith. So it's going to be great. Like, I, I've never had a locksmith on the show. Um, so like him, subscribe or else it's Andrew. Absolutely right. Damn it. Damn it. Subscribe. So it's weird. Uh, the show had 1,180 subscribers and now it's down to like 1,177. <laughs> so, I mean, it's not bad from the standpoint of if you have more than a thousand, you can monetize. So I'm good there and I'm increasing in watch hours. So thank you so much. Everybody who has been watching the show because yeah, we're, you know, we're increasing in watch hours and it's, I would project by like June, we cross over 4,000 where we can monetize the channel. Uh, monetizing the channel has a purpose, and that is if there are any ad, you know, revenue or super chats, you know, but whatever, like probably ad rev revenue. I'm going to use that to buy my books and then um, donate them to libraries. So that's where that money will go to. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
this <laughs> this is uh from Swamp Dog Armory Safety Doc Secret Dancing with the Stars episode. Wow, I don't know about that. Um, but yeah, uh, <laughs> wow, <laughs> that is that is funny. Um, you know, locksmithing is an uh, essential skill, it is. I learned how to pick locks in college from one of my college, my roommates uh, who was good at that. And it all started because we had been locked out of our apartment. You know, this was back in like 1992 or something. And then he's like, here's how to like, you know, <laughs> get into our apartment if you're ever locked out. And then I, I had this kind of curiosity for it. Um, and was able, was able to kind of learn basic how locks function and, and stuff like that. But actually, I was dating uh, a girl at the time, and she locked herself out of her apartment. And like her and her roommate, they couldn't get in. They were they couldn't get a whole landlord. I went there with my rudimentary knowledge, right, <laughs> and was able to like pick the lock and get them into the into their place. So yay! Always like and subscribe. Thank you. We're already up to eleven, so we're off to a good start here. Um, I once had to uh, pick the lock on my Plymouth Duster when I was out at the farm and I locked my keys inside back in like 1986 or something like that. <laughs> so yeah, I took, I took some wire from a fence and I uh, was able to, to, to do it, which was a hell of a thing. So, uh, so three, I think I actually lost more. Um, so I, I don't know if people like intentionally unsub, or if like their channels just get nuked and then they're gone. Um, Cause I don't know if I've done anything to really warrant anybody unsubbing from me. Like I don't, I don't think I've ever unsubbed from anybody, um, but it would be fun to, to see it go like, you know, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4 K stuff like that. So if I lock up my bike, I have to run a cable all over, but yeah, yeah, I've got, so the bike, I, you know, I bike 100 miles, so my my distance bike is worth a lot of money. I've had it rebuilt over the years, but it, um, I never <laughs> I never leave it anywhere. Um, or I mean, it, I always have an eye on it, and uh, but I'll even like take it out in the woods and walk somewhere if I have to go and chain it up and you know uh, take the seat with me or like take the wheel off and put it somewhere else. Uh, thankfully, that hasn't been an issue but uh but yes um yeah it's mk joe good evening safety doc and folks thank you thank you thank you ice skating more like uh with your yeah it's been cold it's been a really cold 2022 so like the ice is thick around here we've had very little snow though so the snowmobile trails aren't open so kind of strange right <laughs> like the, the, the lakes have like two feet of ice you know so like that's usually the problem with the snowmobile trail is you can't open it because the lakes aren't frozen over river stuff like that so that's all froze and you know i live close to two small lakes ice shanties all over the place but we haven't had snow like you know 12 14 inches of snow the whole winter so just you know not enough to groom trails nothing in the forecast either so i've burned through a lot of firewood um, I started my 13th cord tonight and I have, um, what, 18 or 19 cords total I had for this year. So I'll, I'll get through, I heat my house with wood, but it's a little closer than what I thought. My a little tighter. Like I, I thought I'd have some reserve left. I don't think it's going to be that way at all. Um, <laughs> so at the end of my property, I, I, uh, I take the ash out, right? And I, I empty out. And, I, and now I have like a lot of ash out there. It looks like Mount St. Helens, for those of you who are familiar with the 1980 blast, which happened the day my brother graduated high school. It's the Mount St. Helens blast in Washington State. Um, but yeah, it looks like it's Mount St. Helens out there. And when that when we get to, you know, like some hot days in May or June, I will start to break up that pile of ash. And then I will um, actually spread it on my yard and rake it in because it's it's good for your yard as long as you don't put it on too thick so i just you know make sure i got a thin layer of ash throughout the yard a lot of nutrients i mean it's all hardwood so, you know oak and kind of you know maple stuff like that so um but right now there's like you know my neighbor's like what the hell is going on in your backyard there like, you know a like, helicopter crash i'm like nope nope <laughs> it's ash so uh it is the way that it is um so New York Outcast wrote, locksmiths have been targeted in some areas lately for auto key programming equipment. Tell the guy to be smart about that. I will. I'll ask him that question. 
Um, somebody was telling me, yeah, that uh, people can are, are hacking your like remote entry stuff to your vehicle and they can get in, you know, that way. So, but I'll ask him that question. So, um, yeah, sounds good. It's our good friend, Nick Tubis. Uh, evening, Doug. But it's the best logo ever with the uh, A and W root beer thing. So, um, yeah, uh, A and W root beer. So we have. Um, so I live close to the owners of our local A um, and W Dairy Queen. It's not our Dairy Queen and A and W are like two blocks away from each other, down a different part of town. And uh, and the guy he died. He was fifty five. Kind of a sudden death type of thing. So I'm like, whoa. Um, so now the Dairy Queen's up for sale, but I love that logo, <laughs> Mictibus. So, um, so I have some. I, have, I don't know if I have breaking news, but I have I have news, and I think it's good news. So first of all, for all of you, um, right here, please subscribe, and then I'm going to do my my pitch <laughs> right here. This is my eight dollar sport coat, by the way. Um, I got this at Goodwill. So my wife was checking out you know things at Goodwill, and then she texted me and she said, "Hey, there's a sport coat." And it looks like it's in really great shape and it's your size and it's like $8. Like, what do you think? And I'm like, yeah, let me, I'll drive over and check it out. So I did try it on. You know, it's a little, little big, just a tad big at the like waist. Cause you, you know, they have like a 38 or 42 waist, obviously like I'd go the smaller waist, but it's like, it's really a good sport coat for eight bucks. <laughs> and so, and I had my, I had my uh, Oscar de la Renta uh, brown sport coat. Um, the sleeves hemmed on it because they were a little bit long and that I, I wear that when I teach my university classes or when I do like media appearances, um, it's a nice sport coat. Like in brown is kind of a good offset color for me. And, uh, anyway, I had a tailor in town, Nona, and, and she said, oh, this is really nice and, and stuff like that. And she said, what? She said, I have to, you know, I, I picked up this way. I have to ask you, like, what'd you pay for this? You know, like, you know, like five hundred dollars. I'm like, I paid like twenty bucks for this. I'm like, it's every sport coat I get off of eBay. She, she said, this thing is so well made. Like they just don't make sport coats like this anymore. So it's probably like vintage, like eighties, and it's just it looks great. Um, so I have my roster of sport coats, like five or six sport coats, which I think you know I Febreze the hell out of them to get you know to get them through the last couple seasons here because our local dry cleaner closed for good after like ninety years. Um, and, uh, I need to drive these to the next dry cleaner, which is like 40 miles away, but I'm going to wait till my, my Navy pea coat, my official Navy military pea coat, which I wear, I've worn for 25 years. Um, I always take that in and get it dry clean. I didn't do it last year. I need to get it in, get it professionally dry clean, take all my sport coats, get them clean too. But, um, but anyway, yeah, it's my $8 sport coat, which is, uh, it's really nice. So, and this, this pin right here is from UW Stevens Point. It's hard to see right now, but anyway, um, they, they had this thing where they're like, Hey, alumni, if you want a, a university pin, just contact us. We'll send you one for free. So I'm like, yeah, you know, sounds good. So I, I sent, you know, I said, here's my address and they sent me three of them. So I'm like, I don't know what well, I'm going to do three of them, but thanks. So UW Stevens Point. Um, interesting because on campus, they have this thing called Schmeekly Reserve. It's, this prairie reserve. And um, remember the Oregon Trail? There were like, there, there are still ruts. You can go and see this, like, I don't know, Utah or whatever the hell. Like, I, I researched this a year or two ago. There are, are ruts from the wagon wheels. But through Smeakley Reserve at UW Stevens Point, right here, there are wagon wheel ruts still in there from the 1830s, maybe. Um, so, yeah, this is like a documented area and stuff like that. And, I don't know. It's just kind of neat. Like points, point is kind of a well. It's a cool town. It's a college. It's a college town. That's uh, where I attended some of my college. So it's a good place. Um, we like to go up there in summer. They have it's a it's a the Wisconsin River goes through it. And one time they um, one time they dammed the Wisconsin River to do repairs downstream, and it went totally dry in Stevens Point. So this was maybe like eight nine years ago, and they. They were warning people, don't go out because it's the the mud is going to be like quicksand and you're going to pay for your own rescue if you go out there. There were these signs. The reality was it wasn't like that at all. We went up there and, of course, my kids were really young at the time, so we didn't do anything really crazy. Like, we didn't go out <laughs> onto the, where the river was and it was totally dry. 
but um, but they, all kinds of stuff out there: bikes, tires, cash registers. So people are like going out and grabbing things and pulling them to the shore so they could dispose of them, clean up the lake. But um, one time when I lived in Point, I lived there a couple of years. They rebuilt the bridge. They tore down the bridge, and um, the one across Wisconsin, they rebuilt it. And I went down there with a lawn chair, and uh, there were a lot of old dudes. Like I was maybe I don't know somewhere in like thirty at the time. And there was these, these guys like 60, 70 years old, and we just would talk. Like we'd meet up every day and set up our lawn chairs. It'd be like 10 of us, and we'd watch this bridge be built for this, you know, during the summer. It's cool stuff. So, um, so guys, I've I have some news on this too. So big news, breaking news on this book. But this is School of Airs, Rethinking School Safety in America. If you don't own this book, you should. If you're Vanessa Kitty and you'd like to write reviews, Vanessa, maybe. You'd consider writing a review for this book, but um, so yeah, this is a hard copy and ebook, but it also is going to be re-released. The publisher notified me last week and said that this book is popular. It's in hundreds of libraries across the world. This book is going to be re-released in 2022 in paperback. Um, so what that means, I'm not sure. Obviously, it will be. Um, it won't cost as much as the hard copy. This hard copy. 30 bucks. This thing I've had since it came out in 2019. And there's, I mean, the corners aren't bent in, you know, the, the spine's not giving, this is a great book. Like it's just made really well. Like, right. Um, you could defend yourself with this book. I mean, if you had an alligator charging you, like you could, you could take care of it with this book. Um, but yeah, there's going to be paperback versions. So that's good for me. Um, and Anyway, this is the most honest book about the $3 billion school safety industry. What's happening in school safety? I know it might seem boring, but it's not. If you're a parent, if you're a teacher, if you're a taxpayer, where's all these dollars going, you know, for bollards and stuff like that? It's just crazy. Um, this is the truth book. I knew when I wrote this book, I could never be an administrator again. No one would hire me because <laughs> this, you know, it, it's just the, it's, it's the truth, right? And um and yeah, and people will email me you know, and say, thank you so much for writing this book. It allows me to have a conversation with my school board that I couldn't have had before. And there's great stories. Uh, I depicted 9-11. I worked with Dr. Uh, Paul Rapp, head of military medicine, uh, the, the folks at the Department of Planning in New York City, the psychological aspect of the rescue of 9-11 of 500,000 people in nine hours from lower Manhattan. How did that happen? There's books out there like... Um, I don't know, American Dunkirk and stuff like that, which are okay, but they're, it doesn't get into the psychology. And this book does. It's really well done. So there's also big news with this book. Dun, dun, dun. Um, the publisher has offic officially, finally, reverted the audio rights to the book to me. <laughs> so when I, when I, this book was under a publishing contract as the Velocity of Information, which releases on August, or not August, on April 11th. Um, but School of Airs was, was, you know, the first book that I wrote, it was under a publishing contract with a, a traditional publishing house. So it's all good, right? Because then it gets into libraries, a national, international book. Um, but the publishing house, I did not ask for the audiobook rights. And so I, 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 re, I approached the audio or I approached the publisher um, a few months ago and I said, I'd like to have the audiobook rights because you haven't produced the book in audio. It's been out almost three years. It's it's continued to sell well. That's why they're re-releasing re it in a paperback. So I don't know what the price will be, but I'm guessing probably under 20 bucks for a paperback for this. So it's going to be a nice accessible point to keep the book going. So they, so you know, we had this discussion. Oh, I don't know. You know, if we're going to, maybe we'll do it at some point in the future and whatever. I'm like, well, come on, like release the audiobook rights to me. So last week they released the audiobook rights. And the condition was, we'll release the rights to you for an audiobook, but you have to narrate the audiobook. <laughs> so the Velocity of Information, which releases April 11th, releases in hardback, paperback, ebook, and then it is also being produced in audiobook, although that releases later. Um, so, but audiobook has been sets so a professional actor, professional narrator doing the audiobook, and you know, that's. So, but for School of Airs to be an audiobook, the publisher is like, you can do it, but you have to be the one that narrates it. And I was like, yeah, I'm up for that. So game on, publisher. So um, so 
the kind of the breaking news is, um, gosh, my, I have like a gray shirt on here, which doesn't seem to have, <laughs> it seems to be formless. Like it's taking on all these wrinkles and different, uh, geometric patterns today. I don't know what's going on here, but, um, but yes, yeah, so my publisher, uh, so anyway, I, I contacted a couple, um, recording studios in my area and actually one in my town, which is two miles from my house, been in business for 20 years. And I said, here's what I'm trying to do. And they're like, yeah, we can, we can do this for you. Not only we can do this for you, we want to do this for you. Like they, they've done other, um, they have a profile of 20 years of, of also doing, you know, like some narrative stuff and, and community outreach and really good, really good place to, to work with. So, um, I, I start Wednesday morning. And I will be producing the audio version narrated by me, David Proden. Um, I'll be narrating School of Errors, and I'm looking to uh, release it in August. And yeah, so it will release independent of the publisher and be accessible to libraries, be accessible to you. Um, it'll be affordable, right? And um, and you'll get to hear me. So I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, I, you know, I definitely know the content are shorter chapters. So, um, but it's, it's weird because I never thought I would be the one narrating my book, but yet like a lot of people contacted me and said, would you offer this in an audio version? I said, yeah, there's more to it because it's under publishing contract, but then would you narrate it? And school of errors is written a lot where I am writing it to you. Velocity of information. I interviewed a lot of people, so it's their voice. So to have a professional narrator works really well for that. But for School of Airs, um, I think it'll match. And you know, like I, I present on PBS, you know, the podcast and things like that. Um, I think I'm I'm up for it. So, but it's this weird thing. I never thought I would do it. And I was also having this kind of existential moment of thinking, you know, like this is a legacy thing, right? Like once it gets released. It's out there, you know, be audible, stuff like that. But it's out there for my kids, you know, grandkids, relatives. I mean, when I'm no longer here, you know, years, hopefully years down the road, right? Um, people will be able to not only read the book, but they'll be able to hear me narrate the book, which I think is really a cool thing. So, um, so yeah, officially Wednesday morning, I go to the studio and we start the recording process for School of Airs. And there will be an audio version. I also worked at the School for the Blind. And a lot of you know this who've been following me. You know, it's actually the best job I ever had in my life. Um, so I do have friends who are blind and they will, you know, they encourage me and kind of prompted me. And they said, Dave, you, you know, and the publisher will say that an ebook is accessible to people with visual impairments, but my friends who are blind say, not really. Like an ebook is okay, but a narrated book is much better if you're visually impaired. And, you know, I really wanted to make this book available um, to people who have visual impairments or print barriers, but especially people who are blind, visual impairments. So one of the things too is School of Errors will be, I will make it free to all of the state, um, 50, the state schools for the blind. And um, I'm going to work with the Federation of Blind to make sure that it is accessible for free. Um, so for me, that's a, it's, a big thing because I worked in that environment. And when I produced School of Airs, I always felt it was a missing piece that the book wasn't in audio. Um, because yeah, again, like I've I have you know terrific friends who are blind and, and said, Dave, the best we love the book, but the best way for us to access the book would be to have it narrated. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, and you're gonna get it narrated by me. So the voice you've heard a lot of times. Let's get over here to the chat. And then um, I've got a great one lined up for us today. I already wrote the blog post for it. And this is this has been a fun show, uh, not a fun show, but it's been a fun, well, it's already been a fun show, but it's, this was a, I should say, an invigorating topic for me. And I want to thank uh, Jim McIntosh and, um, you know, the and New York um, Outpost for prompting me to to look into this. It's, it's learned behaviors. And I crossed over this when I was doing my research for the velocity of information. I wrote a section about the Minneapolis I-35 West um, bridge collapse. And I remember the day that happened, we were on vacation, family vacation, came across the news. Um, but there's there's so much more to that that I, I broke down I wanna talk about today. And I didn't include it in, in the velocity of information because it, it, didn't, it wasn't really appropriate for the book. Um, 
But you're going to learn some stuff today about this learned behavior, this thing called Bray's Paradox, which um, basically came to be in 1968. And it's going to make sense to you. Um, but, and there were studies, like <laughs> I found this interesting study about like you take humans and you, you know, watch traffic patterns versus like ants, you know, like there's studies of they would put ants as if it's equivalent to a highway, like a three ant highway, they have getting to their food source and like, what do ants do versus humans? There's some really cool stuff. So I've got it all ready to go, going to go through it today. So hang in there with me. appreciate it. Let's get to the chat here. So many appreciate all you guys appreciate the uh, 18 likes already. That's awesome. Appreciate the watch hours. So really good stuff um so yeah uh let's get uh let's get to this um <laughs> the plastic card trick still works was it was that on um, the movie the burbs where uh, tom hanks and they're taking out the credit card trying to get in there and they snap it off or something like that so st that's an underrated movie but not against deadbolt right um New York outcast uh Swamp, it it always uh, seems, I'm, I'm catching up a little bit on the chat here. It always seems counterintuitive to me with all high-end bikes having so many quick disconnect fittings, especially on the wheels and seat that would typically be areas to secure it. So, yeah. So I have, I have a bike that is more of a mule. Like my bike um, is, I've had it, I don't know, for maybe like 10 years now. I had it rebuilt several times. Um, but I, my bike is for a hundred mile trek. That is the purpose of my bike. My bike is not to go 45 miles an hour or, you know, uh, my bike is, is completely built to do long treks. So, cause I, you know, it's heavily weighted down. There's a lot of, of, of bag area on, on the bike and stuff like that. Um, so, and it works great for me. Like I love my bike. I wouldn't change anything about my bike. Um, but yeah. And then with, you know, kind of the accessory, I do have, um, like the main bag slides off where I would have like my phone and stuff like that. But I usually don't have play. I, I mean, I don't usually have to stop when I'm riding. Like I bring everything with me, but I do have places that I could stop. I always figure those out on my route. And then I usually just kind of hide my bike. <laughs> so, you know, I'm usually in pretty good shape with that, uh, quick in and in and out with that. So, um, God, I miss biking. I'm so damn sad that honestly, there are times here in Wisconsin when it'll be like July and it'll be 90 degrees. And I'll be out biking for a day and I'll, and I'll just think at that moment, this is so good. I am so happy. I love that it's hot out. I love being out here biking and I know that it'll be February 7th and it will be cold outside zero degrees <laughs> and I'll it'll just be chilly and I won't want to be outside and, and I'll, I, everything's icy. So even if I could bike, like it would be miserable and I'm like, I'll just miss that. So um, I'm about two months away from biking season in a typical year. Usually that first week of April, I could get the bike out for a first run. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It is, it's a religion for me. I absolutely love, uh, biking. Um, and yeah, any, anyway, winter makes me sad. Like as my friend, Aaron Clary, right? Cappy, <laughs> he said, you know, why would you pick Wisconsin to live? You know, you love biking. Like that's your thing. I'm like, you so once you get to November, November to uh, April, you pretty much can't, you can get big tire bikes and I guess like do this stuff but i mean who the hell's gonna do that not me i don't like the cold i mean i guess that's one thing like but i don't i don't like that i mean i love you get 90 degrees and i get up early and i can get in 100 miles a day like i'm happier than hell i am just smiling um i love it so yeah um jim mcintosh well i have a mountain bike a two-piece frame skewers on the wheels so i have the wheels up the frame nice good yeah, um, I have to. I think I have to get new tires before the year starts. I've got some uh, pan, uh, pan eracers on there, so I have to get those from order from Japan. Yikes, yeah, supply chain. I don't know. I'm in pretty good shape otherwise. Um, I it takes me an hour to prep my bike. Um, so yeah, it takes me about an hour to prep my bike. I'm going to do a video this year, uh, just um, about biking. 
I'll be, it'll have to be a premiere, right? But I'm going to do like, here's my, here's how I prep my bike. Like here's, I'm out biking and take some video of that. And here's some of the places I go. I got some cool places for you guys. Like a thousand year old effigy mounds aren't too far from me. I bike by on one of my routes out of town. Um, but yeah, so I love biking and, uh, yeah, actually, I mean, I don't know, really never had a bad experience. I wiped out once like severely <laughs> damaged my body and, and they rebuilt the bike, thankfully, but uh, but that was bad. I got a concussion off of that and stuff like that. That was there's just things that happen, you know. Bike long enough, you're gonna have those things happen. Uh, I still have all the scars from it. Um, yeah, that was weird. That was that was the time I I so I had this concussion. It was a horrible accident. It was hor- I mean, it was bad. And uh, and then I biked back after. Like I didn't break any bones. I cr- maybe cracked ribs. Um, and I biked back and I only had one gear um, and I was bleeding my, my leg, everything else. My, I was just bleeding the whole time. Like my leg was all cut up. And um, I mean, it was a, a significant injury and I, I was concussed. It took me hours to get home. And uh, I walked into the house and my wife and daughters were at her mother-in-law's like over that weekend. And, um, I don't remember all of it. That's the thing. I, I knew I was, I, I had to go to the doctor. So we have a hospital like a mile away. So I went in and they're like, yeah, you're concussed. And, uh, and they said, I don't know if it was, they said not to sleep or what. I don't know. Anyway, but I watched the dark night like five times in a row, which when you're concussed is really weird because you become part of the movie. <laughs> so I'm like, I, you know, it was like me and Heath Ledger, like hanging out in the whole time in that movie. Um, it was weird. The next day I went out to the garage and it looked like I was, I had gutted a deer out. There was blood everywhere, blood on the side of my vehicle, my old lacrosse at that time. Thankfully it was a gray lacrosse and I waxed it. So I was able to clean it up pretty well, but just like, cause I was coming in, bike was all, uh, it was a, I was in bad shape, man. I was in, I was in rough, shape. but I, you know, I, I started biking like a week later. I, I biked again and I started to run again and, uh, yeah, it's stuff like that. But I went out the next day and I was finding like parts of my bike still on the side of the road. <laughs> I don't know. Nobody helped, but it is what it is. Um, I would uh, know why people would break in and you, you get lost to the tech online and Amazon or other e-shops without the risk of breaking into a shop. Who would say criminals aren't smart? That's from our friend Swamp Dog Armory. By the way, people are asking me... Um, so my book, The Velocity of Information, is releasing on April 11th. So let me bring that uh, up real quick here. Thanks for being here and sticking, sticking with the doc. Um, this will be a great show, so trust me. But right here. So that's the cover of the book, right? The Velocity of Information. Actually, the publisher sent me the complete cover today, including the back art, artwork and endorsements and stuff like that. everything looks great so <laughs> i'm like yeah it looks good um but but yeah so um i don't know where the hell i was going with that but let me try to make sense out of this so um oh so people have been asking me from other countries right they're like hey would you send me a signed copy i'll pay you like what does it cost be like i don't know <laughs> so so i've taken you know with school of airs which is similar size Philosophy of information, a few more pages, but take it down to my post office. And I'm like, you know, here's this address in whatever country. What would it cost to send this to there at the cheapest like level? So they're like, here it is, $22, 10 cents, whatever. So then I email people back and I don't have an e-commerce site set up, which I think I should. So if anybody wants to help me with that or just send me not, I won't remember it from the chat, but if you can post or send me an email or something, um, I... I need to do that because I get that request fairly often. And typically <laughs> either I just say, I'll try to figure it out. I'll take a book to the post office, get your address. And then I will, you know, you'll have to PayPal me or something. And, and it usually works, but now it's the request is becoming more frequent from people in other countries who want signed copies. So I need to have some process to do this. It kind of makes sense. Um, so, and every time I go to the post office, like they're, they're always like not happy. Like everybody's angry at the post office. Like the post office workers are just not, here it is. This is what it is. They used to be really friendly. When my daughter was like four years old, she had this uh, Sesame Street post office 
worker, like a mail carrier, right? I don't know, Burton Ernie or whatever it was, but, um, and, and she wanted to give it to the post office because the guy who worked down there at the post office was like this old St. Nick type guy, you know, like seven years old, just real jolly, good personality. So every time we go down and get stamps or mail something, he's just super outgoing. So we went down there and she gave this, like, I think it was Ernie as a postal worker. And then he put it up on the shelf and back. So every time you went into the post office, you could see this up there. That's all been like, you know, changed and stuff like that. But, but at that time, it was really cool. But every time I go in there and I ask them, like, what would it cost to send this to, you know, Canada? They're like, get the hell out of here. Out of here. Who sent you here? Swamp Dog Armory? I'm like, no. Jim McIntosh? No. Toy Town? Maybe. So, um, so it's our good friend, uh, Toy Town Inc. Thanks, buddy. So, uh, All Pro Lemon Ton. I love the bike. Always love the bike. So, my, my screens, my background screens are, it's a picture I took of my bike um, just in, in a place where I would always kind of stop for lunch on one of my my routes, which is literally like a thousand feet from these thousand year old effigy mounds. So guns of barbecue, Jonathan Berger. Thank you so much, buddy. I did uh, repost our show from a few weeks ago talking about truckers, which is especially relevant right now with what's happening in Canada. Right. So thank you so much. Um, Bull Rush. Our friend from Texas, Bull Rush, who collects 22-inch monitors. So he has an entire house and garage and storage shed full of them. That is his thing. 22-inch monitors. If you want to get rid of one, you just want to buy one on Amazon or eBay and directly send it to him, contact Bull Rush. He's the collector of 22-inch monitors. Um, eight dollars. Heck yeah. Yeah, this the sport coat, eight bucks. <laughs> I never paid. A lot for a sport coat, right? Alfie paid, and uh, usually it, it works out pretty well for me. Um, but so, Doc looking sharp. And that thanks. This sport coat is, um, I I lucked out, I really did. Uh, and they had another sport coat, which was pretty cool, it just wasn't, I would have had it too much tailoring needed to be done on it for it to fit. But, uh, but yeah, I'm like eight bucks, you know, but um, yeah, it was, <laughs> it was probably someone's I is. They're going to be buried in it, but they're like, oh, we're going to cremate them. So take the sport coat off. We'll donate it to Goodwill. So um, Jim McIntosh, you think? Yeah, tailors are uh, the tailor here. Yeah. So a lady, her name's Nona. She's tailored a lot of stuff for my daughters. They're in dance. So, of course, her dance outfits need to be tailored. Uh, but she's done, you know, stuff affordable, a couple weeks turnaround. So it's one of those things where, like, when she's gone, like, I don't know if anybody else will take that up. She's probably been doing this for, like, 50 years, but I appreciate it. I lost my uncle's wool, USM and C wool overcoat. Oh, sorry to hear that, Jim. Yeah. Yes, mine is a USMC. No, mine, excuse me, mine is a US Navy issued and uh, 25 years. So things like new. And the thing was, it also survived um, when I was in that horrific uh, car accident in 2019. Um, I was wearing that coat and the coat had zero blemish. <laughs> I was beat up really bad from the accident. The coat was just the coat walked away on its own, just shook the glass off of itself and was like, hey, I'm the coat, um, which is weird. Yeah, no, nothing, no tears, no buttons, no mending or whatever. It's like, what the hell? So, yeah, um, interest. I mean, that, that might be a show at some point, but that was that was an accident that I remember the insurance um, appraiser, whatever, like they said, whoa. I am surprised you survived this, you know, after looking at the vehicle. And when I went to retrieve my personal items from the vehicle um, a day or two later, like, I was like, holy God, like this is bad. And the thing was, like, I pressed the CD player and it exit, it, it um, puked out the CD <laughs> that I had, the meatball soundtrack, which is weird. So it was its last effort, giving its last energy to me. But that was, that was a, that was a freaky setup there. Um, Jim, they just don't make those anymore. True. One out of 10 people who went to the Oregon Trail down. In, yeah, Oregon Trail is wicked. And the fact that you can still you can still go there today um, and see the wagon ruts. So, I mean, it's pretty amazing. Like, I'd like to do it. I mean, like I have, you know, two teenage age daughters. So, like. They wouldn't be into it at all. Like it'd have to be me solo. I'd have to like find someone who would be interested in that. So 
Swamp Dog Armory. That's kind of the thing, right? Like I want to go to like Gettysburg and stuff like this. But when we went out to South Dakota a couple of years ago, and we've been out there before, but you know, it's like uh, when you try to to arrange things that all of the family would be interested in, it kind of eliminates some of the things that I am interested in. So it is Vanessa G23. Thanks so you guys for subscribing. We're already up to 18 thumbs up here. So thank you so much for the thumbs up. I appreciate that a lot. I appreciate it. We had eight people or eight um, comments last time too, which was really great. So I appreciate that. Um, hey, it's Vanessa AG23. We're going back and forth here. Hey, 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 Um, Our good friend, by the way, Robert Ribbit, Ribbit Harrison. So I always appreciate uh, Robert's been a long time. Um, fan and contributor here in the show. I think I've seen that on YouTube under audiobooks talk. Um, so uh, yeah, what? <laughs> I don't know. I don't have, my books aren't out in audio right now. They will be though. Um, so the velocity of information originally with that contract that comes out as an audiobook. It's delayed. It'll come out a little bit later, but that's an audiobook. professionally narrated audiobook. Um, yeah, then my, and they'll all like pair up like the ISBN numbers and stuff like all match. So like if you search for my book, like the audiobook option would be there. But I'm looking at August. I figure if I can get it by August 15th launched, it'll be, it'll hit that back to school wave, right? <laughs> and that will be uh, some of the, the press that will maybe carry it out there. I'm just excited. You know, I just think it's, I'm excited to do it. It's new. Um, it's a good mix. It's here in my community, right, too. So, um, you know, literally I have to drive a mile to get to the studio. Um, so it's it's good. Like, this has a good feel to it. I'm glad I was persistent, um, you know, with the publisher to, to get those rights reverted back to me. Because basically I said, hey, it's been three years since this released. I know it's doing well, but, you know, you haven't exercised your clause to do the audiobook. So like, let's revert it back to me. Like I want to do this. So, um, so here we go. This is from bacon Maldito and in Inglewood bacon is uh, a lot of people don't know this, but he is going to be part of the halftime performance of the Super Bowl. So um, yeah, I don't know what's going on, but um, bacon Maldito is participating in Super Bowl Inglewood um the los angeles rams cincinnati Bengals. so my guess is he's going to be kicking field goals uh bacon has made a 92 yard field goal at uh the uh, greater inglewood sports complex so probably something like that kind of just a performance show at halftime which i think will be awesome by the way so bacon maldito catch him sunday at the super bowl um where does Doc's books can be used to make shift both profile armor? Yeah. What was it? Teddy Roosevelt was shot in, in uh, Milwaukee and he still went on to give a speech. Although like his speech, like slowed the bullet, but it still went into his chest. I was at that location where that happened a few years ago. Like there's like a sign in the doorway or something saying, Hey, Teddy Roosevelt was shot here. And like, Holy smokes. Um, Hey, CNT designs that, Hey, you're new. So please subscribe, buddy. Hold on, kids play nice. I have to put the kiddos to bed. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, 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 thanks. Grabbing coffee. Oh, God. Yeah, my wife uh, said today, if you're not making coffee in the coffee maker upstairs, I'm going to, like, put it downstairs. So, which means, like, I need to start making coffee again. Because downstairs is just going to work. What's up, y'all? Hey, it's DLD. DLD is, uh, this guy is making trailers for movies. It's kind of his thing. TLD and Tom Hanks making trailers. So it's good. I don't have the Apple stuff, so it's a little harder for me. Uh, it's, you know, I know Apple has all the cool stuff. We'll prepay for audio. So, yeah. So when my book, so when both books release, um, audio will be an affordable version, probably like the least expensive for all of them. Um, but for School of Airs, audio will be really reasonable because the rights revert to me i get to set the price on that and it's gonna be low because i want people to have an act have access to the to audio plus i'm not a professional audio. i think i'm pretty good though like right <laughs> a 
I know I'm, I'm kind of like I've been on PBS, you know, I got to like people like remember our friend Matt Hoover at CRS Firearms. I understand, you know, thinking of Matt right now, but Matt, um, uh, I've been on his show. You've been on my show, but then like he called me up one day and he's like, Hey, like you got a really good voice. Like you got a, like a really just like good podcast radio voice. I'm like, well, thanks. Cause I know he's very into the analytics. So it's from soft tie armory. So many fellows. Hey, hey everybody. It's a good friend. Um, Doc wanted me to narrate his book because sadly I had to cancel that. <laughs> After massive, like, okay, fake it. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Very nice. An audiobook from you would be very nice to listen to. Thank you. And Vanessa, I actually will have, um, for people I know, right, and people who have also bought the the book, I do have um, the, the arrangement is I'll have a, a, a certain number of um, pass right like i can give you a code and you'd be able to download the audiobook so um and i would do that for you vanessa because i know you have the the print version so um yeah so i think it's gonna be fun and i think it's gonna be like i said this cool legacy edit because i'm trying to think like you know if my, it was if it was my grandfather or um you know great grandfather or something like that you know like narrating some book or whatever or some something on tv or whatever like, it'd be pretty interesting like honestly doc if you're good with the pacing for audiobooks your voice is good hey thanks for picking yeah so i am good with the pay yeah and like the the studio so the person i'm working with has had a studio for 20 years um and knows this stuff right so like understands the pacing and of course has all the technology to make sure all the files are rendered correctly and so I think um, part of it will just be that I'll have to keep the pace up. Um, but, you know, it's all good. Like, I'm excited to do it. This is a uh, DLD to Toy Tony. Robert Rink, hey, what's up, fellas? Hey, guys, I'm serious. So, um, all right. So let's get down here. We actually have a show going today. This is, is that Matt Hoover. Right. So Bacon posted a link to uh, Matt Hoover. So um, is that through? Yeah, GoFundMe. Wow. Yeah, um, GoFundMe is pretty <laughs> pretty scary though isn't it uh bacon and everybody you know like what what's been happening with um pulling funds from people and things like that so i understand the support for for matt right completely um i i am hopeful that you know gofundme um treats matt with uh the respect and dignity that he deserves in this fundraising process so Looking forward to having you on the Swamp Talk show. Yeah, absolutely, Swampy. You bet. Um, oh, by the way, like no Apple price. Uh, yeah, I don't have any of this. I, I've been approached by two um, by two vendors, by two businesses to um, to sponsor the show. So what that means is I don't really know because you know I, I obviously. I, I pay for whatever the expenses are to run the show, which aren't a lot because I run it. I guess it's a stream yard or the other stuff. But um, so they are, you know, organizations that you would know or, or like businesses, but they've offered me, and this is in the last two weeks, they, they've said, hey, like we like your show and stuff like that. And we'll, we want, you, you'd have to run like a 30 second banner of ours or an ad or whatever. And we will give you, um, x number of dollars of merchandise you can buy from you can get from us for free but i'm like yeah i don't know i it just wasn't for me like i'm i don't need any of this merchandise and <laughs> man scares yeah, funny so i'm talking me no it wasn't it was also it was survival stuff so there was one where it's like pretty cool backpack and stuff like that but i'm like you know um the if you go down the sponsorship route on a show like this um, it just isn't, you know, it screws up, I guess, monetizing and just other things. And, you know, so I did consider it. I was kind of going through and like saying maybe some of these things, but, but it was, it was kind of fun, you know, like, you know, people saying, Hey, like I'm whatever from here, like, give me a call. We've seen the show and, um, you know, we can, we can give you product, right? So we can give you X number of dollars worth of product if you plug our show. So. But I'm like, I don't know how many short sleeve suits I need from JC Pennies. So um give send go seems like the better option right now. Yeah. For fundraising. I don't know. GoFundMe <laughs> seems really I don't know, a lot of questions there. 
Um, I'll give ghosts um, similar to fun. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, Jim, enough about it. Um, I don't think it has like a blue check on Twitter. So Raid Shadow Legends, yeah. I hope GoFundMe reverse the decisions giving the fund money to group. I think what they did, Vanessa, is they refunded the money free of cost to the people who donate it, but not to the group. So, yeah, I don't know. It's just, yeah, I guess so, to be honest. Just been told so. Okay. Well, we're 50 minutes in. It's been great. Let's get into today's show. Um, I appreciate all of you, by the way. Um, and thanks for the thumbs up and the kind words. So um, as I as I pull up my notes here, I'm just going to move myself out of here and put the show logo up. So this will just be a second. All right, we're back. So um, what is Bray's paradox, right? So this is this is the question, what is Bray's paradox? So because I have the notes already assembled, I'm going to do some verbatim, verbatim reading from this, and then we're going to talk about it. So this is this is counterintuitive and there's a there's a huge safety aspect to this. <laughs> this is like um, when something goes bad, right? Safety wise in your area to pause and think, what are most people going to do? And then to think, well, what am I going to do so I'm not caught up with everybody else? Like everybody's going to go, for example, where I live. I live, at, I live adjacent to an interstate. Um, so if there was some evacuation or whatever, everybody's going to go to the interstate, which will probably clog up the interstate and slow down the interstate. So like, what is the second think, secondary thinking of, of what else can you do to not get yourself caught up with 90% of people? It's our good friend, yo, 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 flying rich. Rich is just like, I'm taking my uh, airplane and I'm going to like taxi down uh, my road and fly away. So I'm like, works for I don't have that. Um, so what is Bray's paradox? So does Bray's, um, B-R-A-E-S-S. I guess you can put an apostrophe in there at the end for possessive if you want to. What is Bray's paradox? So Bray's paradox states that counterintuitively adding a road to a road network can slow down overall traffic through it. The paradox was discovered in 1968 by German mathematician Dietrich Brace. At the root of this paradox is that every driver thinks for themselves as the lack of cooperation with other drivers means that every driver will aim to make the uh, fastest route possible. So they'll try to get the fastest route possible. Hence, the shortest route becomes overwhelmed and also slows down merging in traffic from lesser traveled nodes. So if you're on a side road, you're trying to merge in, it's going to be hard because like this main road's overwhelmed. Um, so you, you cause delays on those side roads and it just kind of ripples. Interestingly, in, this, in New York City, Boston, London, and Seoul in the last five years, traffic congestion decreased um, as they took away roads. Uh, so they, they shut down roads that were going through cities and they found out that within about a week, congestion actually decreased. So let's get in. So Bray's paradox. I do have a an image I want to bring up for this. Um, I should have it set to the what? No, it's making me go through it. I'm going to bring it up. I have it set to the exact spot here. So here we go. It's going to come up on the screen. Um, share screen. Here we go. There we go. Okay. So you're looking at this thing. What's happening? What's going on here? Hey, it's Zippy to Strange. Um, so, okay. So look over here where the my cursor is. Um, origin. So let's say this is you. This is your house. And you want to get over here to your destination, which is Pizza Hut. You want to get to Pizza Hut. So I don't know why they don't deliver anymore. You got to drive there. Pizza Hut's not that great, but 
just one of those things. You're like Pizza Hut. You're like Flying Rich. I'm like Pizza Hut. Pizza Hut. Bolo's like Pizza Hut. Can Canadian Pizza Hut. So here you are, and you want to get to this Pizza Hut over here in blue. So here's the deal. So let's look at this road configuration. This is this is a two lane road going up here in the orange on top here, and then suddenly it hits this four lane road and it gets you to Pizza Hut. So that takes you, let's say, 20 minutes, right? Okay, you're going to Pizza Hut. So down below, here's a four lane road. You're flying along pretty fast to Pizza Hut. Then you slow down a little bit on this two lane road, get to Pizza Hut. So what Bray's um, paradox, you know, puts in is said, you know, what if you what if you made this shortcut? So people could always be on a four lane road. So here you start and you're going down to Pizza Hut. Then you go on this four lane road. And then you're here and you could actually get there like faster because it's a four lane road. So from a logistics standpoint, this kind of makes sense. This is how like Houston, the city of Houston, Texas is designed, you know, adding more roads and things like that. The problem is that when you start to take, let's say we're here at the yellow, we go down to the green. And then instead of going on this two lane road, which is slower, you're like brr, flying up this like four lane then you're hitting us four lane and you can get to pizza Hut faster because all this is faster right four lane um the people who normally take this route up here they're like well you know <laughs> screw this we're not going to take this extra time to to take a slow road we'll go on the fast road and then we'll go on a fast road and fast road so the people that normally would have taken the road up top hopefully this makes sense <laughs> because it took a while for me to figure out but uh think about it as people in your town or people in a community or whatever, city, whatever. They some people are taking these exterior roads to get to where they need to go. They're not taking the main road through town. They're taking some of the side roads, lesser traveled state roads or whatever to get to where they're going. Well, once you once you eliminate um, that incentive, and you're saying we're putting in a super highway or something, people are going to take the super highway and they quickly overwhelm it. So that is Bray's paradox is saying, hey, you're quickly overwhelming these new routes. Um, so and when you do that, right, like then they slow down and naturally they slow down. Um, let me get out of this one. So, you know, like in the cities of New York and Boston and Seoul and things like that, um, what they did is they actually eliminated some of the main roads that were going through the city where you might have like four, five, six, seven, eight lanes and, you know, decrease those. And people found, oh, I'll just take these other roads that are more out, you know, in the city and exterior to that. And I'll, I'll use those. So you spread people out across more roads and it was more efficient. So this was a weird thing, right? That people the more roads you would put in you think it would be more efficient but it's it doesn't happen that way and then people trying to merge into these roads have a hard time you know if it's like in six lane highway and stuff like that so you're like huh it's kind of counterintuitive so yeah so that's the first thing so bray's paradox means that <clears throat> the more <clears throat> wow voice right Reading an audiobook is not going to be good then. So, um, so yeah, it creates this part, and this is where Flying, Flying Rich is saying it's so busy, nobody goes there. So, so yeah, either like you, you overwhelm the road where it gets to the point where nobody wants to use it, and they're like, I'm just going to, you know, use these other roads. And you're like, oh, we put all this investment into these main roads. Why isn't anybody using them? Um, so, so yeah. So let's think about that. So Bray's paradox is it's this counterintuitive thinking. You got a really busy area, you're gonna add more roads, or you're gonna add more power line grids. Or, I mean, you could get into all different areas, you could apply Bray's paradox, not just roads. But um, the, when you do that, people then, instead of um, kind of sticking with what they were doing, they're like, well, I'm gonna take this. So suddenly you just have more people flood into it and it overwhelms that system and it just collapses it, right? You get traffic congestion, slower speed stuff like that so that's one of the things that happens there's this other thing that is um there was a study uh, there were a few studies that were done and it was uh, human versus ant so let me put that you can find these studies human versus ant 
Um, so, <laughs> so human versus ant. So let me read this. According to scientists who studied traffic density for humans and for ants, it was discovered that when the occupancy rate of the roads exceeds 40%, people gradually slow down their speed and stop after a certain stage, thus congested traffic or traffic jams. If ants, on the other hand, in ants, we observed um, an opposite phenomena. As the traffic density increased, the flow increased at the same time. When the occupancy rate of the road reaches 80%, the ants synchronize their their tempo and continue on their path at the most optimum speed so yeah so what they actually did in these studies so I, was re- I was researching these studies and watching video is they would basically make like a little road for ants and they would have food at the end of it right and, and so it'd be the equivalent of a three lane four lane highway and then it would narrow it down to two lanes and see what the ants would do stuff like this and what they observed is um the ants goal was survival of the community they're working as a group right like all of us in cars we're working as individuals but it's kind of weird so what when people get on interstates and interstates start to get congested the tendency was for people to slow down um and then eventually like stop and i think it's because right people are afraid if someone stops in front of them they're not going to have sufficient time to stop and hit somebody and stuff like that so part of this is a technological issue but um, so the, the bigger these highways became and the faster they became, as they got more congested, people actually slowed down instead of speeding up. So like the 405 in Los Angeles is an example of that. You know, as it gets more congested, people don't kind of speed up to keep the pace. They slow down. Um, so this is interesting stuff. So what the ants do is as it gets more congested, the ants will go faster to keep the flow going and then as they like narrow it down into like a two-lane highway the ants kind of naturally just like the people that are getting close to two lanes speed up a little the two ants speed up side by side and they go the next ant speed up side by side so it's fascinating to look at this right because this is probably where we'll be at with more automated driving ai stuff like that that these vehicles will just keep a faster pace and things like that automatic braking, adaptive crews, understanding what's happening a mile ahead, right? All that stuff will probably be out there. But for right now, you know, you look at this and say, I mean, I never knew this until I researched it, that um, when, you know, and these are multiple studies, when people are on interstates or in, you know, going through big cities and things like that, and maybe six, eight lanes, I remember going through Tennessee on our way to Florida, like that was like 10 lanes or something. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, that yeah uh you know as it gets congested people slow down and then of course anyone trying to come on an on-ramp that slows things down further so the more lanes you add the more people you get out there the more populous it is the slower it gets so that's this whole human versus ant thing so this thing of bray's paradox now what does this mean and we've got more to get into this and learn behavior but what does this mean for safety I think like Joe Dolio talks about this quite a bit. Um, if you have to evacuate your area, some you know sentinel chaos event is is happening. You got to get out of there. The you know if you're coming on to these you know your your interstates and things like that, like those are going to be overwhelmed, right? That's what everybody is kind of thinking. And once those become saturated, they will slow down. That's the part of the study is once they become saturated, like they don't continue as a speed of 60, 70, 80 miles an hour, the speed decreases to about 40. And the more congested, it slows down even more than that. So you can kind of see this in Florida, right? Like Rich, like when you see video of people like, you know, here's your routes to evacuate out of hurricanes and stuff like that. Um, you know, they'll keep the I-4 and stuff like that going. But I think there's a real uh, uh, central point in this of, uh, thinking counterintuitively in safety. If something is happening and a lot of people in your area are impacted by this, including you, what are most people going to do? Like how, and then like, so you don't become part of that, how you can work to get ahead of the pack and out of harm's way. So I think there's a lot to that. I wrote about that in the velocity of information also, somewhat in School of Airs, but velocity of information to think of what is what most people are going to do and then try not to do that don't get tied into that 
Um, I was just thinking about this recently because we have we have some very um, se- you know very secondary roads in our community which will lead us around the the interstate. You don't even have to cross over the interstate, and like you know, um, and I was checking some of these out over the the past couple of weeks, and I'm like, this would be the route that I would go. <laughs> like, I could get up 40 miles easily away from here. You know, I'm kind of closer to a metro area by taking these these lesser roads, which I don't think a lot of people would take. Now, the thing is, like, you never know how people will, how Garmin's and their devices and vehicles are going to steer them. That's why. We hear these stories of, oh, like there's this lesser known, shorter path road, and then everybody takes it and it overwhelms it in this community. Kind of the AI sells us out, right? So the first thing is, is Bray's paradox. When we add more capacity, people kind of flock toward that capacity and they overwhelm it. (laughs) So not necessarily a good thing. We think it's going to be, but everybody kind of goes toward that. No one wants to take the rustic road. Human versus ant. Humans, when things get congested, we slow down. Ants, when it gets congested, they speed up, <laughs> keep things going. So I've got the next thing here, which is forced learned behavior. Um, New York Outcast uh, had brought this to my attention, so I'll get to that in just a second. Let's go over to the chat, though, first. Um, the chat, um, this is from uh, Rich Anstone Crash and Burn. True, right? Because if you're driving a vehicle in high density at 70 miles an hour, somebody makes a mistake, there's big consequences for that. So this is something where once, if there's, you know, the thought adaptive cruise comes into play, um, AI and things like that, the vehicles would be able to operate at a higher speed because not only would they be aware of what's happening in front of them, but a mile down the road. Um, I have a friend who works for General Motors and said, you know, that's kind of our goal, right? As we want to have all of these vehicles to be able to interconnect at some level so they understand the mosaic of what's happening with the other vehicles around them with like in a mile. So we'll see if that happens. Um, so um, this is G23, who's probably a new subscriber. Thanks, G23. The goddamn bacon. I know he has great insurance and they will just cut a check. So, <laughs> right. Uh, G23, you got to leave a, a lane free for Flying Rich unless you want him hitting your, Flying Rich or Robert Ribbit Harrison. Or, um, yeah, uh, you know, Bacon Maldito. I mean, there's a lot of people who just kind of just bolo. Bolo is like 100 miles an hour in Canada. Um, yes. So Flying Rich just presses a button. The wings come up, up on the vehicle. Gone. Uh, Swamp Dog Armory, that's analogous of a highway of self-driving cars that are network. That's the goal. So I talked to a, an engineer with uh, General Motors uh, a few months ago, and he said that we're planning in the next 10 years that the v- at least General Motors vehicles, you would think it would be all vehicles, right, that they're, this would be kind of standardized, would be able to understand what's happening so if like four vehicles a half mile ahead are all hitting their brakes, your vehicle would recognize that. Like there would be some system for that happening. Um, so there can be great efficiencies built into this at cost, right? <laughs> By the way, when I kill switch in your vehicle, so I don't know about that. Um, New York Outcast, I only hit one car. So um, human error is why we don't have flying cars, so. Yeah, the Jetsons. We we're supposed to have flying cars by now. So what a sham, right? That show was nowhere near accurate at predicting the future. Uh, but Flying Rich is uh, perfect at flying. So, but yeah. Um, inter- this is interesting stuff because this whole Bray's paradox hypothetically would be solved with AI and technology. So, you know, what does that mean? Um, for roads and stuff like that? Or would we need to increase? Could could we go back to increasing roads then because the AI would know how to handle it? Or I don't know. But um, New York Outcast, I would have better luck with Flying Rich hitting my house. So Flying Rich is a good guy. A New York Outcast, the average car has no lift. A car is more like a flying brick, but <laughs> someone made one recently. So it's so weird because, you know, we have... We have the two vehicles, right? My wife drives the SUV. I drive the the very low to the ground, 300 horsepower 
look, you know, Buick. <laughs> and uh, and they're completely different vehicles, you know, from profiles to like the way you drive them and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, like um, anyway, I just, it's it's just funny. They're they're so different. Uh, love comma AI. Hi, driving car. Comma AI was legitimately impressive. I have no idea what that means. I'll have to look it up. How hard is it to get an auto gyro and a license to fly? I don't know, Jim. Um, but I, we're not, I, I shouldn't say we're not far from that. We are on a trajectory, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, to hit singularity in the year 2042 or 2048. As a scientist, I can tell you that with at least my confidence as a scientist. I think I'm a pretty damn good scientist, by the way. Um, so meaning that um, AI, robotics, and interfacing with humans will hit a point of being, I don't know, I wouldn't say equal, right? But but kind of like being able to, to synergize in the year 2042 or 2048, like within that six-year range, we should have this happening. If you want to know what I'm thinking about, it's really like the movie iRobot with Will Smith. If you think about iRobot, that will happen in 2042 to 2048. But like kind of the first half of the movie where it's just showing the ability for robots to work in society and AI and stuff like that. Not like the second half of the movie where it's all <laughs> negative science fiction, crazy stuff. Um, so I don't think it's a bad thing. But that's kind of what I'm talking about is this whole thing of uh, 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 synchronizing. That's... There are multiple, multiple, multiple studies. 2042 to 2048 is when we're going to hit that. So um, anything can be hacked, blocked, or simply a glitch if it gets outdated. I prefer True. I mean, I'm not. You're right on, New York uh, Outcast, completely. Who's to say? <laughs> I mean, not who's to say. I mean, it's probably likely to happen, right? So I kind of think I, I uh, kin it to um, when Will Smith was driving and then those robots start jumping out of the truck in front of him and he like takes over on the steering wheel. He's are driving. So robot driving. But um, but yeah, I, I do think I think there'll be that version, at least in our lifetimes. Um, I don't anticipate to live longer than 100 years, by the way, but um, I I don't I think there'll always be that that hybrid. But I think there will be a point, um, you know, 2050 on where you'll have just autonomous vehicle options. I honestly think most people will prefer those. Think of younger people. I just, I think most people will prefer those. Not of our generation where we understood, you know, the eight cylinder, you know, double barrel not, or four barrel, you know, vehicles and, and uh, doing donuts and all this stuff. I mean, but the, if you're born, you know, after the, the year 2000 and things like that, I, I think you're going to, if you, if you offer these people a choice and say, do you want a self-driving AI vehicle? And there could be these issues, whatever, but likely, or do you want a vehicle that you can have some autonomous control over? They'll say, I want the AI vehicle. So I just believe that. Oh, heck yeah, says TLD Dark. Uh, Jim McIntosh, I would like, I, I would think there are the same or cheaper than 48K for the average price for a new car. So, um, yeah. I don't know if I was talking about 48K. I was talking about, the year 2042 and the year 2048 is the point when AI and robotics kind of becomes very functional in society. Like we start to see robots walking down the streets and doing some labor and stuff like that. Um, that is likely in the year between the years 2042 and 2048. So, yeah. Crazy, yeah. Forty-eight k for a new car. It's crazy the price of new cars. Yeah, like I, we sold our old, our fourteen-year-old car at a much higher rate than what we would have got it for it, and then but our new vehicle was expensive. Um, just, I don't know. So I'm hoping to keep my uh, night, my 2017 Buick LaCrosse for years. So no, no intention to get rid of that anytime soon. I watched a swarm of drones in a hangar actually create a. Uh, hive mind under their own control inside of hangers and trip. Yeah, true, Vanessa. That and I wrote about that. I don't know if it's a philosophy of information, a journal article or something, but like that's out there. <laughs> so the real threat in the, like the military threat is like, what do we do if uh, uh, you know there's a drone launch on a carrier or something, right? Like how do we how do we counter that? You know these. Um, 
so there's an interesting thing if you ever you can google it it's um a drone landed on the queen elizabeth or queen mary was queen, i don't know um warship back like four or five years ago so this guy's just out there with his like recreational drone flying around and he's like trying to get pictures of this like uh you know aircraft carrier while it's docked and his battery's low and it lands on the ship and he's like oh christ like what am i going to do now and uh and so anyway the i don't know what he i don't know how he got it off like if he was able to like give it some time and then like boot it and fly it off or whatever but um no one recognized it right like it was just sitting there on the deck of the aircraft carrier for like an hour or two and then finally like he flew it off to, and then he went immediately to authorities and he said hey like i was just taking some pictures i'm an enthusiast this thing landed on the deck um i don't want to get in trouble or whatever and they're like okay like just go home like you're fine don't worry about it it's like do you want my address like do you want it? i i feel like i've i shouldn't have done this i like you're good you're solid and he it, so it was a really weird story because like they interviewed him like i don't know bbc or something he's like i thought like they'd break down my door they would take my drone and the video capture but it's this right the the thing is um yeah we're, we're at this point you know where there's there's many transition points in history right of of um warehouse manufacturing is just in time to 3d but also warfare from traditional warfare to mosaic warfare based upon drones it's not far out there i mean the military has already invested billions of dollars into this they've they've demonstrated that they can do this so yeah finesse is like what a way to ruin my evening no so <laughs> um the dld bolo the single most skilled motorcyclist bolos and bolo drives on snow a lot of people, snow tires on a motorcycle at 100 miles an hour is a hell of a thing i wouldn't even want to try it bolo he's like i've got it he can balance himself in any position that's kind of his thing so as a motorcycle starts to like weave over like he just he adjusts it's all about balance so but that's bolo it's canada um comma ai is a self-driving kit for your cars too oh i didn't know that i'll have to look that up wow so that's pretty cool that's wow um whoa so good stuff here uh new york outcast this is from bacon the f4 phantom was described as a flying brick it's proof that you can um, fly make anything fly big enough with big enough engines so whoa this is our friend uh, zippy zippy saying um flying cars need a hell of good technology and super rich uh, company to pay for the insurance yeah and you would think so unless um you know there's some government you know proclamation or laws or exemptions on on what the maximum could be if you get in an accident with a flying car or something like that so i you're right i don't know some of these things will be regulated to a max like you can only get so much on a malpractice insurance on a medical suit right there'll be something that'll come out there on this i don't know i haven't i can't even imagine flying cars at this point although i love back to the future by the way this is the new york Rock. sure bacon but getting it to glide to a safe landing is another thing so thankfully i have a pretty long driveway but maybe not that long so i could have my hovercraft um for the zoomers in the chat wondering what doc is talking about four barrels is a reference to the lens of cover yes he used to have a four barrel couple four barrel cars so yeah so four on the floor three in the tree so all that um this is swamp dog armory look at the opening of angel has fallen with the drone swarm attack that isn't just sci-fi that's uh just super expensive currently but tech is available yeah yeah look at wreck it roll for god's sakes with the drones no it is it's available um the white papers that i've read for example and kind of the stuff that i do you know how did safety not get to retire at 50. there's reasons for that right um th this technology is very uh more uh prolific than right what we <laughs> what we will ever know from the media um so it's it's very um very uh fascinating scary i guess all those things in one um yeah um gonna have to head out soon got more deer to finish tomorrow well i'll tell you what swamp before you head out i you know, i still have the second half of the show to go i'm going to play swamp don't head, head out yet i'm going to play the uh intermission um video that was produced for me by my good friend swamp dogs so i'm going to do that right now so hang with me 
I will be back after this intermission. And here it is. Thanks. This is compliments of Swamp Dog Armory. Swamp Dog right here. Yo, yo. compliments of our good friend uh, Swamp Dog Armory and I will change it so I don't have the uh, side stuff up but uh, hey it's really cool I appreciate that that was really cool um so thanks Swamp Dog he created that for me um as a gift to the show so a little intermission entertainment so yeah you get to see me doing some things that I normally don't do on the the show and then uh, it was fun so thanks buddy um so forced learned behavior. So let's talk about that forced learned behavior. So this is kind of like, why do we go along with things? Like when people tell us, hey, like you should do this. You're like, okay, I will. Um, so one of the things is uh, back in the uh, the 1960s, the Milgram studies. So uh, let me just go over that quickly to kind of set the, the frame for this. So I'm going to talk about the I-35 bridge in Mississippi and the collapse of that and some really weird things that showed up when people, when the bridge was open again <laughs> and the behavior of people. It's not what they anticipated. So the Milgram experiment uh, back in the 60s is, uh, they, they, it was a university experiment. They brought in um, students or people and they paid them like five bucks, right? Here, participate in this. 
So somebody would dress up in a lab coat. They would look all official and they would say, here's a dial. You have to turn from zero to 10. And it's shock therapy. It's kind of like there's a hint of this in Ghostbusters, right? There's shock therapy. And it's based, if people are responding incorrectly to um, questions, then they would get a shock. So you you would participate in this, right? And this person in a lab coat would tell you, okay, like turn it up to four and shock them, press it. And then in the other room, this person, would, there'd be a light that would come on. So they know like the button's being pressed. They're not being shocked, by the way. And they would, they're actors and they would be like, ah, oh, this hurts and all this stuff, like whatever. The thing was that, force learn behavior if somebody was telling you to do something and they seem to be in a position of authority you you typically did it so when they did this experiment the milgram experiment they didn't expect that people would go along with it so after the first time someone yelled oh you like you're hurting me or whatever this person be like i'm out of here i'm done you know i'm not going to put this person through pain i'm getting five bucks for this right the thing was like, they would kind of look over to the person who's there with just a lab going on and then they would just continue to do it. And they would only, they would turn from three to five and then they'd be like, turn up to seven, turn up to nine. This person would be like, oh, like I have a heart condition. Like I could be killed by the shock. They would still do it. So this force learned behavior is evident. Um, people will typically do what you tell them to do as a mass. Now there's there are some conditions with that that we're going to break down. But people will do what you tell them to do, especially if you present an authority. If you present a sport coat, like honestly, I mean, there's been many studies on that, right? If I come in and I present in, as an expert witness or something and I'm wearing a sport coat and, um, you know, like a tie and stuff, like I'm much more likely to be taken as a credible witness um, as if I'm not wearing this, right? So there's some of this in how you present yourself uh, very, you know, um, a stern presentation that there's there's no question this is what it is people are like okay like that's what it is force learn behavior we tend to believe in our organizations now this is <laughs> right this has been challenged the last two years but we tend to you know believe in our government organizations cdc our local government things like this so if there are chaotic events that are happening crisis situations if they give directives people will typically follow the directives so this is forced kind of learned behavior. Um, so let me read what I wrote here. Um, when people are forced to alter their routines due to an unexpected dramatic event, such as a bridge failure, they tend to begrudgingly follow government place detour signs and also they poke around for a new path that allows them to complete their commute. As their accustomed to primary route is out of service, drivers tend to stick with the first experience new routes, even if they are not particularly efficient. They would rather travel a known route than attempt to find a shorter route. One would think this patterning would be readily tossed aside once the previous route uh, was available because it's shorter, it's faster. Um, that's what happens during expected closures to familiar routes. However, the I-35 bridge collapse in 2007, it reopened in 2008, New Bridge. Um, demand did not bounce back as expected on the bridge. So anyway, let's get to this forced behavior. So the point with forced behavior is, if I tell you ahead of time, this is likely what's going to happen. Like I live next to the Wisconsin River. So if, you know, the, the city is saying the, the river is rising. It's likely in the next 15 hours, it's going to hit flood stage. Okay, then I'm anticipating that, right? Now, it's one thing if I'm anticipating it, I'm more likely to go along with it. That's very well proven. You can tell people like horrible stuff and they're likely to be like, okay, like I'll brace myself. I'll go along with that. If you tell them it's, it's you know, it's going to happen. This is like, this is what's down the road for us in the next five, 10 hours. People are like, okay, I can process that. I, you're telling me ahead of time. I got it. This is why when I work with school districts and I did consulting, um, I worked with school districts that had active shooter situations, right? So a student had killed himself or other students. When I would go to districts and do trainings, I would say at your start of your training, tell people that if there is an active shooter situation on campus, right? they will not be able to access their classrooms and their vehicles probably for a day or two because 
Um, this is one of the things that I saw when I worked with districts where there was were active shooter incidents. Um, people, I mean, no one anticipated that was going to happen. And that's one thing too, at the start of the year, I'm like, talk about it in your in-service. If this happens, this is X, this is likely the response from police and so forth, whatever. But um, people would try to, um, they, so the situation would be be complete. And then people would be like, I want to get back to my classroom to get my keys, to get my car, to get out of here, to get home. They'd be like, nope, it's a crime scene. You can't get back. And they'd be like, oh my God. And they would just break down. They would cry and they would yell. And you, you can go with me, officer, whatever. I just need to get my purse. I need to get into my car. I need to get home. And they'd be like, it's a crime scene. Parking lot's a crime scene probably tomorrow we can arrange for you to get home. Um, and then people kind of lose it a second time. But if you tell people ahead of time that if this happens, something sentinel happens in your school and you know there's a crime scene investigation, you're probably not going to be able to get to your classroom or your car or something. They'll arrange for you to get home next day that you know, you'll probably have access to those things. People handle that much better. Um, so this whole forced behavior is if you know that something is going wrong or anticipate that something could go south pretty fast, tell people around you, <laughs> especially your loved ones and your close ones. This is likely what we're going to anticipate. I remember that with um, the whole pandemic stuff back in March, like sitting down with our daughters when they were young and say, hey, here's the deal. Like, you know, March 13th when they're shutting down you know, NCAA basketball games at halftime because of the virus and stuff like that. We sat down with our daughters and said, we're going to shop two times a day. You know, I'll go out at one time, mom will go out at another. And it's, you know, we might not have certain things. We don't know your school's closed. We don't know when that's going to open. Um, but here's what we anticipate. You know, there's going to be more things that are, are going to close. Um, we're going to work to get the things that we need, right? You're probably not going to be able to see your friends. A lot of stuff that you like to do, your dance lessons, things like that are probably going to be like shut down for weeks. Um, and because we were very upfront and told them that, and when these things did manifest, as we had said, they handled them remar remarkably well. We actually had a trip scheduled for Disney. We we're supposed to fly out to Disney and it Disney shut down. And that was one of the things right away, too, he said is the whole Disney trip is up in the air, right? Like Disney could shut down. If they shut down, obviously, it's not happening for us. We still want to do Disney. We'll do it at a different time. But so then when Disney did close, it wasn't like, you know, these kids, oh, my God, I can't go to Disney and stuff. You know, we've been there before. But but they were like, okay, like we've been told this. Um, so forced learned behavior. One is people just generally do what they're told. And you know, for New York, you know, because mental condition, you're right. People, I've had more, in a, you have to look at this as a percentage, 100% of people, if more than 50% of people just go along with it, which they do, they will trust the government, they'll trust the news, uh, and and they'll just go with it. They won't question it, right? So it's forced learned behavior, and it's very important. So let's go back to that I-35 bridge. So the I-35 bridge, um, Interstate 35 crossed the Mississippi River in Minneapolis. It collapsed in 2017. It was a structural failure, wasn't anticipated. So in an instant, boom, bridge falls down. Um, so this is something that is not anticipated by anybody. So, you know, the next day, a couple of days after that, the, the city of Minneapolis is putting up signs to people like, take this route to like, you know, get across the, the river and stuff like that. And it took, it was very difficult for people to adjust to that. They interviewed people. So I have all of the studies. I concluded some of it in the velocity of information, but not all of it because it wasn't really the, it didn't match the book, like the theme of the book, but here's the deal. So people be like, you know, I'd see these detour signs and be like, nah, I don't want to take it, but I'm going to take it and whatever. But then when they would get across the river and stuff, they would kind of find like the first route to get them to their destination. Like they would you know, side streets, you know, go down, I'd go down Oak street and then second and maple and over to 23rd and whatever. And if this gets me to my destination, like that's what they would stick with. They would not try to improve upon that. Like that, if that route got them to where they were going, they would stick with it. That's interesting because, um, that behavior happens when you, um, kind of in, inflict chaos on somebody. They didn't anticipate that the bridge would collapse, right? There's this crap catastrophic event. They're, they're terrified by it. 
So as soon as they figure out a way across the to the other side and they find a way to work or whatever, they stick with that. They're not trying to prove upon that. They're like, this is good. I'm comfortable with this. So it is, it was crazy. So what they what they rebuilt the bridge. And when they reopened it in 2008, they thought everybody's going to come back to the bridge. Not only that, the bridge had been expanded. The the um, kind of um, on ramps, off ramps, kind of leading into the bridge, everything had been get, been improved. And they thought we're going to have a braze paradox. People are going to start using this bridge to the point where the bridge is going to it's going to congest it, right? And the fact was that didn't happen. Uh, people were very slow to come back to using the I-35 bridge. A lot of these people were commuters in the area who remembered right when the bridge collapsed. And they were like, screw this. We're, we're taking our long path around this. We're not going to come back to this. So the the Minnesota State Department of Transportation, I have this all kind of cited in the article. They were interviewing people and they said, well, it's a deal. Like the bridge is open. It's brand new. It's wider. It'll cut your drive time down by 15 minutes. And it's and they were like, it's one thing if you would have told them ahead of time. If you would have had signs up and things and said, the bridge is going to close in 60 days. We're replacing the bridge. You're going to have a new route and stuff. People, people would have likely re returned to the bridge, right? But they, because this happened suddenly, unexpectedly, this chaos event, people adapted quickly into this new tourist, their new route, and they were unwilling to give this up. So that's another part of safety and chaos, right? When something happens really fast to people and you give them no warning and they have to adjust to it, it's less likely they will return to this more efficient system afterwards, that they'll they'll stick to this kind of new Taurus that they they have. They just, they've lost trust, right? Um, that's really important because when catastrophic things happen to people and they don't have an idea that it's going to happen, right? Um, you know, I think it's one thing, right? If somebody you love, somebody in your family is on hospice, right? And, and you anticipate they're going to die. And then at some point they die. That's different than you get a call one, one day and it's like, whoa, you know, this person 53 years old and they died of a heart attack mowing their lawn. It's like, I wasn't ready for that. So, you know, these, these adjustments are much different. So this forced learned behavior especially as New York Outcast was talking about this force on behavior is if you tell people ahead of time, even if it's really bad news. So imagine like, you know, New York or not New York, but um, you're, you're driving the I-35 and this is your way to get to work. And it's like, Hey, the I-35 West is going to be closed and you're going to have 15 to 25 minutes added onto your route for two years. People will be like, that sucks, but they would adjust to it. Right. And the other thing is, not only would they adjust to it, but as they would find the new route, which would be marked out by the signs, they would then also experiment and try to look at their maps and things and say, okay, this is what the city planned out, but like, how can I make this even more efficient? That does not happen if you just have this chaos event that introduces into these people's lives. So when the bridge collapsed, they put up these new routes and then like people kind of stuck to them. They didn't try to figure out, oh, can I take the side road? Can I, can I go like three roads down and will that cut off like four minutes of my time? They didn't mess with it. They're like, if I can get to A to B and whatever. But when the bridge opened up again, they did not return. It was like 15 to 20% capacity down. And people just were like, no, I'm not, I'm not doing it. Um, so part of force learned behavior, I think what I'm trying to get across on that is... Um, if you tell people ahead of time or give them an idea what to anticipate, even if it's really bad news, your government or a business or whatever, a family, people have time to process it and handle it and adjust to it. And then when they adjust to it, they also can continue to do what's called simulated annealing or continue to make further adjustments. But if you just bring something on people and it's really bad, um, then they are usually like, okay, I'm going to go to this plan B. Like the plan B is like, here's your route through the city. And they're like, I'm sticking with that forever. Like I'm not ever going back to this. Uh, so it's, it, it is really interesting. So let's think about, you know, as governments, you know, would tell us like, here's what you have to do. Like you have to wear a mask. 
Like I know several people when I wrote about this in the philosophy of information that will always wear a mask. Um, and again, they're quoted in philosophy of information, like for the rest of their life, they will wear a mask in when they're grocery shopping, when, you know, whatever, because, you know, they, they, you know, again, feel the onset of, for example, the pandemic was really rapid and this was like a, something they pivoted to and they're not willing to give it up. So I think the point is if you have anything happening in your life or anything that um, you're perceiving that could start to go really, that could go south really fast in your area, communicate that out to your wife, your spouse, your family, and say, here's where I think things are could go. And it's not, and it, you don't have to be 100% accurate with that. But once you have those discussions, if things do actually happen, people handle those pretty damn well. If you've had those, it's like the schools, again, when I, when I go out and I, I do professional presentations and stuff, I'm like, at the start of the school year, tell your school staff, if there is a school shooting here, it's unlikely that they'll be able to go back to their classrooms to return, to get their personal belongings, which might be their keys, right? So maybe you keep your keys in your pocket, car keys. But it's also unlikely you'll be able to drive out of the parking lot. Like that'll be a crime scene. Um, just because of the investigation. And once you tell people that, they handle that better. They handle that pretty well. They're not trying to beg and plead with an officer. Please, like, just do this. Like, I have to get home. I have to get my vehicle, stuff like that. But again, it 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 it, it boils down to these very personal levels. And that was one thing I think, you know, we did really well in my family with our children at the start of the pandemic was to sit down with them and say, here's the deal. We don't know where things are going, but it's possible. Boom. Dance lessons will be done. Playgrounds will be closed. Schools won't open up for the rest of this year. We might have a hard time getting the yogurt that you like, right? Like the supply chain stuff. Um, we're going to, you're going to see things like, you know, the cat litter, like we're not going to put as much cat litter in the boxes. Um, our trip to Florida is done. We're not sure when that's going to be rescheduled. We'll try to do that. But, you know, you lay these things, but you also say like, we are aware of this, like, but you're safe here. You know, like we have things, we have resources, we know we're stable and stuff like that, but you're going to, to see some things that are different that, and we inter we anticipate that these things will be different. And I thought that was a big benefit for our daughters. Um, and just for our, our family in general. And as I was working with my extended family, like my parents, stuff like this too, I'm like my brother, like, I'm like, here's what's likely going to happen. Prepare yourself for this. Um, so, and, and people handle that better. We don't do a good job of that at all in society. Never. <laughs> right. So, um, and as, as, you know, New York outcasts had indicated too, is, you know, people will follow um, what they perceive as authority. And at some point though, that's going to erode. Like authority is government or government agencies, or it could be your local governor, it could be your county decree or something. Uh, but you have to have somebody to back that up, right? For example, like right now in Canada, like, you know, Justin Trudeau leaving Canada, um, you know, when the truckers are doing their, their, you know, pro protests and things like that, like you don't leave, <laughs> like what in the world? Um, you know, so that is just, it's crazy, you know, to me to, to think about that. But, um, but yeah, so personally, I would say that is what I tell you as a safety expert, right? Is to let people know these, these scenarios. And so anyway, so Coming back to this I-35 bridge collapse over the Mississippi, um, when the DOT, you know, they opened up this bridge, they thought we did such a good job job of increasing lanes and all this stuff. Bridge is going to be, you know, overwhelmed. And I mean, it's a lot of traffic issues. It never happened. And then they're like, what the hell? So then they interview people and people are like, screw this. <laughs> we're still, do we're doing our route. We're here. We get off here. We do this route. We go past Benny's. Delhi, and then we go down here, people who leave their Christmas lights up all year long, and then over here. Um, and it stayed that way for like two, three years. People did not revert. When you tell people ahead of time um, you're closing down something or whatever, it's usually a week, and people will come back to the patterns that they have before that.
So it's just very important the messaging that you use with people. If you're doing this personally, or people around you, people you care, you know, your family, people you love, friends of whatever, um, your member chat network, let them know what you anticipate and the, what they should prepare for. Because if it happens, they'll handle it much better. Let's get over to. I have a few more things here. Let's get over to um, the chat. People hate change. This is from our good friend Zippy. So process, and actually, Zippy, by you, right? Like where the tornado came through, like it kind of forced upon change. So how do you adapt to and adapt to that once a tornado comes through, like in December? It's horrible. Um, heavy water. Thanks, buddy. I'll keep this in mind when it comes to my marriage. I often do the opposite to save my wife anxiety. So, yeah, that's funny stuff. Um, I the more the older I get, the more overt I get in in like anything that we do as a family. Uh, whatever. I'm like, here's what to anticipate: family vacations or stuff like that. Um, but yeah, this is uh, bacon. Um, I agree with Doc. Best to know what's likely to happen before. Yeah. It doesn't serve you any benefit to try to shield information from people. I've learned that. It just doesn't help. Um, people, if you tell them they have time to kind of process through it, and then you also tell them, this is how I think it will play out under this scenario. They handle that pretty well. It's when you just kind of spring things on them that they don't. That's where the I-35 bridge thing, there's a whole paper, and I have it, I think, referenced in the study, where they said, you know, like, how do we just shut the bridge down for repairs for like a year <laughs> and give people notice? Like when we opened it up within an, um, um, a week, people would have just returned to the bridge. But because the bridge fell, collapsed, right? It was a big traumatic event. And then, you know, we, we give these these routes and people are kind of unwilling to take them. But once they like get their route across the bridge, they're like, that's it. This is what I'm taking. I'm not adjusting beyond this. And then when the bridge opens up again, they're like, I'm pretty comfortable here in my route, even though it takes 20 minutes longer. Um, if you don't tell people what to anticipate, you're not doing them any favors. That or people found a better route. Maybe you leave early to stop. Getting, yeah, maybe Zippy. I mean, so they interviewed a lot of people. I think people found routes that were, they would be longer, but they were also kind of comfortable, right? Like they would go through less populated areas of Minneapolis and some subdivisions. So this is the whole thing kind of with a braze paradox is actually when people found these routes, it worked pretty well for these people. And it because it was dispersed over different areas, it didn't create this big traffic pattern of congestion. So it actually worked pretty well, if that makes sense. Scenic routes are, th yeah, there's a couple scenic routes in my area, which I absolutely love. Absolutely love them. Um, twisty roads are an R6's best friend. Bolo always drives fast, always under control. Toy Town, I must be an exception. I try to find a detour quicker route, even on Crow's flight path. So yeah, I can, um, so, I mean, so yeah, right. People will find like the quickest path they can or their devices, right? Their garments will, or their vehicle stuff will, Tell them this is the quickest way. Um, so, yeah. The thing is, um, so with that I-35 bridge collapse in 2007, I remember when that happened, like we were on vacation. I remember we were eating at an, a Culver's fast food restaurant and they came up on the news. Um, so when they opened the bridge up, they anticipated everybody was going to come back to the bridge and like that just wasn't the case. And it wasn't because people were afraid of the bridge as much as people were like, I kind of, I've got my new routine down and I like it. And so they anticipated again, this whole praise paradox where the bridge would be overwhelmed had more lanes and it was more efficient. They thought people would choose this. It cut 15 minutes down there off of their driving time. And people are like, Nope, <laughs> I got my route. And, and the thing is like, because they'd been shifted there because of this sudden chaotic event, people are much less likely to shift back. Even if you offer them kind of this braze paradox, you're like, Hey, like, I know the bridge fell down and that was horrific, right? But now the new bridge is up and it'll cut 15 minutes off your drive time. And people are like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know about it. Bacon wrote to Tipolo. I remember seeing the specs for an RS6 and what it can do. Talk about a sleeper car even for Audi. Wow. Bacon. It's crazy. So I go back to kind of my summary 
take a point takeaway points. So I have a few here. The first one is humans tend to think individually and gravitate to the shortest or fastest path, often overloading it. So we, again, we see it like with the comparison of ants versus humans, right? If you if you add like a third lane, fourth lane for humans, like everybody, then they'll kind of gravitate toward that. Then they, it overwhelms it. It gets congested, slows down. Ants, they keep moving. Um, so also like drive through lines at restaurants. This is something is a braze paradox, you know, so they, they put drive it through lines to try to, to speed up. Like you can use a drive through, but then everybody uses a drive through and nobody goes into the restaurant. So the drive through gets really long and it takes a lot of time. So, you know, all of that. Um, so number two here, following an unexpected disruption and avoidance phenomena is observed that will typically diminish over time. So that again is if I suddenly shut down this bridge, right? It's gone because the bridge has fallen down or the grocery store is closed or whatever. Um, if you do that very, very rapidly without giving people a warning, which is maybe some stuff that happened during March of 2020, um, people are less likely to rebound to that and accept that. So um, that's something to know. If you, if anything, or at a personal level, right, you're changing some things up um, to let people know. I don't know exactly what that would mean. Maybe some of you can put that in the, in the chat. I'd have to think about that a little bit. Um, but yeah, to let people, to let people no. Um, so, you know, I'm running for a city position, right? I'll be on the ballot in April. And that's one of the things that I will bring with me if I do get elected is, you know, whatever is happening in our city, we need to let people know. And there are some things that are happening in our city right now. Um, for example, school additions, some additional roads that would ease school traffic, which in my perspective, um, haven't been communicated out very well to people, especially in the area where I live, like my district. Um, so, you know, I'm kind of looking at that and saying, it's, uh, it's one thing to make these changes and it's another to make these changes plus let people know ahead of time in the paper, like here's the schematic, here's what it looks like, here's what the roads will look like, here's the building stuff will look like and possible congestion points, stuff like that. Um, so, you know, I think, again, letting people know this information ahead of time is a benefit. And the city also has some very big things going on for development. I'm not saying they're doing anything wrong. I'm just saying if I was um, to, to come into city government at this process, this would be something that I would advocate for is extreme transparency and letting people know what the city knows so they can start to anticipate these things that might be, be happening. So, um, number three, in contrast, pre-planned disruptions, even with similar magnitude, generally have smaller, um, impacts. Um, so that is, again, think about this I-35 West Bridge, which collapsed unexpectedly in, and caused fatalities and just horrific event 2007 in Minneapolis or the Minis uh, Mississippi River. Had you known that this bridge was fatigued and had to be replaced, and you're like, hey, within 60 in 60 days, the bridge is going to be closed. It's going to be closed for a year. And you had to sign up. You let people know, here's a new route. So like the likelihood is most people have been like, this sucks, but I'll adjust to the new route. And when the bridge opens up again, I'll return to the bridge. So, which is different because when the bridge just collapsed and they forced people onto this new route, which people were very unwilling to do, when the bridge opened up again, like 20% of the people who typically use a bridge didn't return, even though the bridge was wider, more efficient, thing, things like this. So, again, the bonus tip here is in a crisis, think about how the masses will react. So, Joe Dolio talks about this a lot, but if you believe... You know, there's this crisis event that's going to happen. Whatever happens, right? Your city has to evacuate. Pause and think, where are people going to go? Where are the main roads that people are going to go? Or what are the primary stores that people are going to go? Like what? So then what are the secondary or 
third, fourth options, which might not be congested or where I might be able to get my resources. And like, I know from my city, which is on an interstate, I can drive 40 miles on what is basically a two lane road that is lesser known to get beyond my city further away from my, my city, which is near Metro. So I think there's this benefit. We always, and we don't think this way. We don't think counterintuitively in a crisis. We don't pause and think, what are most people going to do? In the Velocity of Information book coming out April 11th, which you all should purchase, by the way, paperback is the most affordable version, but um, as graphics, really well worth it. Um, once you pause and think, what are most people going to do? Like if you go out to the interstate, there's probably a line to get on the interstate of cars. The interstate is moving at two miles an hour, right? Because, and we know the psychology, once people see people around them, and the interstate is very bumper to bumper, the speed slows down almost to a crawl. So also these things and where are people are gonna go for stores and stuff like that. You can you can think ahead and kind of think your way around a lot of these things. So there's a statement here. Let me go uh, first over to the chat. Um, this is heavy water to bacon. She has thanked me multiple times afterwards. Last time she thanked me profusely Mostly for small stuff, though. I don't know where that started, but that seems like a hell of a great story here. Um, is a toll bridge uh, per chance? So <laughs> I don't know, man. A lot of bridges by me, none are toll bridges. Uh, people respect transparency, even if the news. You're right, New York Outcasts. They absolutely do. And I wrote a, I, I did a show on that maybe a month or two ago where how to um, convey bad news. And as somebody who was a school administrator for a number of years, right, there is there is a, a very uh, defined way to communicate bad news. It could be 16 students and staff were killed in a bus crash. There is a way to communicate bad news. Um, so to learn about that in the transparency and also to say, here's what we know, and I, we will give updates at, you know, 90 minutes from now or something like that. We might not know anymore, but if we do, we'll share it at that time. Um, but people respect transparency, right? This is so crazy to talk about in the way that the government is today. But there is a lot to be um, gained as being a truth broker. I wrote about this in the Velocity of Information. Juan Brown is an airline pilot. He also is a private pilot. I did a chapter on Juan Brown. And, and Juan Brown was flying over the Orville Dam in 2017 as a dam spillway had collapsed. It's the biggest uh, dam in California. Had the dam overflowed and, and eroded back toward the spillway, the whole dam could have collapsed, which would have re resulted in Sacramento being under five feet of water, plus all of the communities between Orville and Sacramento being flooded and largely destroyed. So Juan is a truth broker, right? He's going up there, he's doing these videos, he's meeting with people. So it's a whole section in my book, which is awesome, right? And it, all of us can do that. All of us have that ability to do that or know people who get a member check to, to do that. So absolutely spot on. Um, so this is from our friend Bolo. He said, I vote for you, Doc, but I'm not in your jurisdiction. Yeah, I appreciate that. I see a lot of uh, political signs up in town. I, I said I would run my campaign without any political signs. Um, so <laughs> I'm, I will, if I'm elected, I'll, you know, uh, do my due diligence in the position. Um, but I'm also not putting uh, money into a campaign. Uh, so we'll see where things go. But I think April 5th is the election here. So we'll see. Um, this is interesting, Doc. Been listening uh, most of the night. Thanks. Thanks, buddy. Hey, one fast deck. So hope things are good out there in Alberta, Canada. Um, it's been cold down here in Wisconsin. Not a lot of snow, but it's been cold. So the ice has been building up in the lakes. So I don't know about our friend um, there, Curiosity Inc., but I would think like his house project has got to be going through the roof with additional costs. I I wouldn't want to be building. I mean, he's building big houses. It's cool, but I'm like, holy smokes, man. Like, it's hard to 
be building a house in this type of economy when someone could come back to you and say, hey, you're molding for your, you know, for your doors and stuff has just gone up 50%. I don't know. I wish him well, but um, I always think about him. So, and I think you, know, you guys are, you know him in the same community. So um, I'd say Doc for president, but I don't want to see his life. Ruined. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Doc would never, never make it to president. So I, I think the farthest um, I would go and have a chance to go would be like county representative, which is not out of the mix. Uh, my wife and I talked about this. And three years from now, maybe I would run for like a county position, but I don't know. Um, yeah, I I am not, uh, I have no higher political aspirations, um, nor would I think I would I would be able to survive survive the steps through to get to those. So I'm pretty good. Die, it's Bolo. So um, that would be brutal to have to tell people that. So all problem in. So yeah. The thing is, though, you know, people respect um, truth brokers, right? You can tell if you're a truth broker, an honest truth broker, right? A genuine person, you can tell people horrible news and they will process it. Um, but you got to be consistent. You got to be known as a, as a truth broker. It's so weird too. Like when I work with school districts, I don't do it as much as I used to, cause I, you know, trim my consulting business back. But, um, you know, I would say you're starting your in-service. You tell people if our school is ever a crime scene, this is what they should expect. You're not going to access your classroom, your personal belongings, your car. Someone might have to pick you up or whatever. They'll arrange for that or whatever. And they're like, what? And I'm like, no, like seriously, because I've worked with districts that have gone through this and they will tell me if we could do things over again amongst many things they would do. They said we would inform staff ahead of time that if anything of a sentinel event like happened at our, our school where there was a you know police investigation, the school's a crime scene, people would have limited or no access to whatever, whatever we would do that because that was a that was a really hard part. So, um, yeah, this is from one, uh, Fast Act. Uh, hey, Bolo, good to see you, brother. To, to Canada, sticking together there. Um, New York Podcast. They should have listened to the damn keeper or asked why he kept checking it overnight. Yeah. Reminds me of that movie. What was it? Oh, God. I remember it wasn't that well known. Um, I don't know. Remember it was like a damn gave way and there was like this church that got flooded. I, I'm trying to figure out who the actors were in it. I don't remember. Um, it was it was like a drama maybe like 20 years ago. Christian Slater maybe was in it. So um, thankfully we don't have a damn near house. That's a great story if you don't know it. Um, New York Outcast confidence can also be a killer. So I don't I've honestly I found confidence to never fail me. I found hubris to fail me I, I guess in the respect of but only i wouldn't say in the respect of anything where i've worked professionally with uh, crisis stuff or anything like that but um i think you can underestimate where people around you will try to undercut you or if you start to evolve in a crisis situation to a position of authority that can intimidate some other people around you i think that's authentic but i don't know i don't I still think if you're a truth broker and you're you're very um, fast acting and, and moving into that position of conveying that information, people um, ag acknowledge that with you and you have high credibility. So I have a show coming up at some point. It's called How to Work With, <laughs> How to Survive a Toxic Work Environment. Yeah, that will be there. Doc could be a secretary of it. I could be a secretary of education. It's a messed up, crazy position. I actually have applied to be um, on a committee for the House or for the Department of Human Service, Health and Human Services, the U.S. Department of Government, um, a few months ago, and it was for safety planning in schools. So, but they notified me and they said, thank you, Dr. Proden, for your interest in application, but um, you are outside of the time frame for when we were doing this. So, um, yeah. Um, so yeah, who knows? I don't know if I have any real desire to 
do that again. One fast act uh, uh, from Bacon. You go to take a look at the occupation in your capital. So, yeah, Canada. Um, New York Outcast. I was speaking of the documentary about the dam. I was the, it was the biggest uh, for the time and they didn't know what to, to do. So are you talking about, so is it Orville Dam? New York Outcast, is that what you're talking about? So Or- Orville Dam is the biggest dam in California. Um, and yes, yeah, so I have an entire chapter written about the Orville Dam, 700 foot dam and <laughs> right. So you have this primary spillway where the water is released from the dam. You also have like um, a hydro energy plant where some water gets released, but not a lot through this plant to generate power. But you have the spillway. And then that was the primary way that they would release water from the reservoir. And then you have this emergency spillway, which is basically just dirt. <laughs> so they're like thinking, we'll never have to use this, but if we have to, it'll just like drain down the side of this hill. And uh, so I have, I have this diagram in my book. I have this, this image and it's all labeled and I got it from the people who researched this and they gave me permission. So it's pretty cool. But um, so, so in Oroville, um, California, this reservoir, 700 foot reservoir, um, when they were releasing water, the, the spillway, the concrete on the spillway about halfway down, like gave way. Like I mean, this thing's been around for like 30, 40 years. And then it just like busted apart. So when they were done releasing water, they're like, oh my God, like half the spillway is gone from like that point down. So then the water kept rising in the reservoir. So they had to, they had to be like, well, what do we do? Like if we release it through the spillway, it's only going to go down so far and then it's going to start to erode back. And that's going to be a hell of a mess because if it erodes back too far, the dam complex could collapse, right? This would be the biggest modern natural disaster probably in history. Sacramento under five foot of water. So let me bring up the image of that um, from my book here. So what the hell is going on here? Um, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Images. And yes. So I have permission. This is in the book. So. Okay, let me bring it up. Okay. So that you have an idea of what I'm talking about here. Um, so this is Oroville Dam Complex in Northern California. So this is north of Sacramento. Um, Juan Brown, who I interviewed, had his, his, took his, you know, Luscombe 1946 airplane out. He's flying over this to get an idea of what's happening. So this is the reservoir back here, Lake Oroville. And then here's the dam with it, which is an earthen dam. And then down here is the Hyatt power plant right there. So like it generates some power, but not a lot. It's not like a Hoover Dam type setup. And then this gated spillway right here. So this is all concrete. So this is taken before they had issues with this. So they would open this up and water would come out of this reservoir. And it would come down here and it would em- empty into this river, right? Which would flow downstream. So things would be pretty good. And then over here, this was the emergency spillway. So if for some reason this failed, you could just have things come down the side of this mount- mountain or hill or whatever it was. So this had never been tested <laughs> and they never thought they'd have to use this. When they did use it, like a lot of this eroded, it it was bad stuff. So right here on this, right about where I have the cursor moving, the concrete gave way. This all fell apart. Um, so this was in 2017. So yes, it, there were some problems with the dam, right? The, the spillway. So once this was out, uh, the problem was if you would have run water through the spillway, the water kept rising over here. It was just, it's crazy now because like the Orville dams at an all time low. So it's <laughs> like they can barely get water to come into the dam. It's so low. But um, if they were to run the water again, which they did, the thought was, first of all, they, they stopped all of this, the gate. So it ran over the spillway and it started to erode really significantly over here. So like, well, we can't do this. It'll just erode back. It'll, everything will collapse. So they decided they would open up the spillway 
they had the water come down halfway and then it basically cut all of this out and erode it down and started to erode back, but not at a really fast pace. So this is like a multi-billion dollar project. They're dropping in like huge bags of rocks by helicopter trying to stop this stuff. But, um, but anyway, like the Orville Dam wasn't really covered by the media very much. And Juan did, a, <laughs> did like 30 shows on his channel at Blanco Lirio. So here's the, here's the show. So at Blanco Lirio, if you find him, um, Juan Brown on YouTube. So some of you might have the link to his channel. So I interviewed Juan. Um, and, uh, you know, and I said, why did you, why did you go there? Like, what was your, and he's like, well, <laughs> nobody else was covering it. It'd be like a, a 30 second thing on the news is saying, Hey, like part of the dam, uh, spillway, you know, is not functioning up at Oroville and stuff. And he's like, well, I live close to that. Like, I gotta know. So he flew over it and he was doing some, started to figure out the water coming in, the water coming out. And, uh, they evacuated eventually they took 200,000 people, but had this failed it would have been catastrophic but part of this is um you know i think when juan i guess if we get into this whole concept when juan started to tell people what was what he was observing right people started to anticipate this could be really bad i have to prepare for this right so juan was this truth broker giving people information ahead of time and i think kind of forcing the hand of the state to, to take action on this faster than um you know but so, so anyway, New York Outcast. I was speaking in the documentary about the dam. It was the biggest of the time, and they didn't know. Yep, yeah. I honestly can't recall the name of that. So I don't know. So the Orville Dam is the highest dam in California. I don't know if there's another dam you're talking about, New York Outcast, but the Orville Dam in 2017 was the dam. For example, in nationwide, everyone was starting to pay attention to it after Juan started to do his shows and getting hundreds of thousands of views and actually coming up to the site and interviewing people. Right that. If this dam would have failed, it would have wiped out Sacramento, uh, the capital of California. So um, pretty crazy. It wouldn't have got down to Inglewood, though. Um, I can only go down so far. Oh, my goodness. Um, it's not the one. As long, yeah. Okay. So I don't know. Yeah. Post it if you know. But um, it's a good this one, Brown. So, you know, I'm a big fan of the uh, Dark, Knight, Dark Knight Rises, right? The Joker. And I wanna, I'm going to read a, um, a segment that Heath Ledger read here when he was playing the role of the Joker. So this is from the Dark Knight Rises. And the thing is, this is extremely accurate. This is extremely accurate. So to set up a, a little bit on this, this is when he goes in to the uh, hospital Right, and he's talking with whatever who who is the guy who's two faced, right? Who uh, is the politician who has half his face burned and other half not? But um, but this is a statement from the Joker about chaos, and it's this is spot on. There's no hyperbole in this. This is completely accurate per chaos theory. So here we go. Uh, this is the Joker. I just want or. I have to do a better job if I'm going to narrate my own book. I just did what I do best. I took your little plan and I turned it on itself. Look what I did to the city with a few drums of gas and a couple of bullets. Hmm. You know, you know what I've noticed? Nobody panics when things go according to plan. If the plan is horrifying, if tomorrow I tell the press that, like, a gangbanger will get shot or a truckload of soldiers will be blown up. Nobody panics because it's all part of the plan. But when I say that one little old mayor will die, well, then everyone loses their minds, introduce a little anarchy, upset the established order, and everything becomes chaos. I'm an agent of chaos. Oh, and you know the thing about chaos? It's fair. So, quote from Heath Ledger in The Dark Knight. So, um, remarkably accurate, though. Remarkably accurate. Telling people ahead of time what to anticipate as a potential worst-case scenario is remarkably settling, and people respond to that much better if, than if something is just sprung on them. 
So interesting. Again, I go back to the way we, my wife and I uh, decided to talk about um, the pandemic with our daughters in probably like right around March 13th, 2020. When, I mean, that was a day when things really escalated, you know, like NBA shut down, Disney shut down, like all these things. And when you say, you know, it's not like saying everything's fine or whatever, whatever, you, you know, you sit down and say, here's what we perceive is happening. Here's how we're going to try to mitigate this. Here's how it's possibly going to influence us. Here's how it could influence you. Um, and we are going to, we'll keep talking to you. The more that we know, you're going to hear a lot of things. You're going to see things on TV. You're going to, there's going to be weird things that are happening that you've never seen happen before. Your playgrounds roped off in yellow police tape, stuff like that, which I have a picture of in the book. Um, and I would say those measures were significantly helpful um, as we, as as we approached into those things and a lot of the things that we anticipated did happen some of them didn't but as they did happen it wasn't that big of a thing like i will never i was just i forget but when we so we had reservations for disney i don't know march 17th or something they had them like a year in advance and they got canceled because disney got shut down when we told our daughters disney shut down it's not like they ran around the house and they were angry and it's not like that. They, they they knew because we talked about it, and we said this could happen. Um, and if it does happen, you know, we will. We'd like to return, right? We'd like Disney. We'd like to re return there as a family at, at a different point in time. We'll assess things and stuff like that. So it's more like a pause. But I mean, we had our stuff packed, and my, you know, watching my daughters unpack their their things and stuff like that. But but also like it wasn't this. You know, they were they weren't like really upset or. I mean, we were all kind of disappointed because you know it had been a good time when we had been down there in the past, stuff like that. But, um. So bacon, I don't see him, Doc. Do you know what channel? It's Blanco Lirio. So, um, let me try this here. Blanco Lirio. Yeah. So. Here it is. Um, I don't know if it'll post out of here how this tr how this transfers over to um, how Streamyard transfers over to whatever. But I think it does. There's Blanco Lirio. So, yeah. So the so that's really cool. So um, a few things with the velocity of information. So the book is released, Harvey Dent, right? You're right, Harvey Dent. San Francisco Dam. I think that was, year, yeah, you're right. That was years and years ago, like 100 years ago, right? They anticipated, they, they knew the dam was failing though, and they didn't do anything about it. They kept kind of reassuring people. But like the dam owners were like, holy God, this is, we got issues going on here. I think there's still remnants of that dam you can visit today. So, um, but yeah, so a few things kind of in, you know, in, in summarizing this. So Bray's paradox, the Bray's paradox is if you make things uh, more streamlined, uh, shorter for people, like think of a highway, you're adding more lanes or a shortcut or something like that. Um, the paradox is people catch on to that. And then people who might've been taking some of the Rustic roads, some of that stuff, they're like, well, screw this. We're going to take the short route. And then the short route suddenly becomes a long route because everybody's on it. And also that humans, especially with like traffic systems, but there's other stuff like stores, things like this. The more dense population of humans in an area, the slower things get. But like if it's ants, study of ants, ants kind of speed up. Like they keep things moving. Humans tend to slow down. So and then these interstates and all this stuff, like you add more lanes, but once it gets saturated to a certain point, people slow down and then it's hard for people to get on ramps, stuff like that, instead of like just keeping their speed. And I understand the risk of that, right? Because what if you get in accidents, there's less time to react, stuff like that. Um, 
So that's something that technology will probably resolve, but it, it's an interesting study, this whole ant human study of, you know, these, these videos of like an ant, ant colony going to get food or something like that. Like they would, you know, the, they would maneuver these areas as if it was a four lane highway and then going down to like stuff like that. And these ants would figure it out. Like they would keep their pace up and stuff like that. And I understand a 12 ant pile up is a hell of a thing, but, um, but yeah. So, and then this whole thing of if something catastrophic happens, like the I-35 bridge collapse, you've driven over that bridge for 10 years going to work and boom, the collapse happens. You're less likely to return to that bridge after it's repaired even though you'd be like oh it's a brand new bridge new technology it's wider stuff like that you're less likely to do that now if somebody had told you 60 there would have been all these signs up at a time saying the bridge is going to close 60 days from now it's gonna be closed for a year you'd be like okay and then when the bridge opens up you'd be right back to it so when you introduce chaos to people or chaos situations happen and people don't anticipate them, you haven't primed them ahead of time, whatever they kind of grasp onto as their new Taurus or their new safety zone, they're less likely to give that up, even if times return to normal, quote unquote, which is kind of what we see now in some capacity. People are less likely to give up wearing the mask and maybe some of their other behaviors um, because they just don't, they don't feel they were given enough warning in the past. They don't feel the system was there for them. Oh, this I, the system should have told me this was going to be happening. So all of you listening, right? The point is, if you are aware of things, so let's say it's like a family member who has cancer and they're likely going to die, which is terrible, right? But to not tell someone, oh, you know, they're not feeling well, they're going to treatments or whatever. It's much better to be upfront and say, this is what's happening and enjoy the you know time you have with them now. And this is like how things are going to be going. And I shared the story once before. One well, of my very good friends had cancer. Uh, she was in her forties. We were both like in her forties, but, um, and I was visiting her throughout, um, her, uh, you know, treatments and things like that. It was, prog it was progressive, it was terminal. And I remember one time I went up to visit and it was a fun visit, right? She's in a hospital bed though. And just like looking out a, a room that could look out to the, the main road going kind of past her place and stuff like this. And, uh, and I remember when, well, when I left, like she said, I'm, she said, listen, I'm, I have what, maybe eight to 10 weeks left of life and they're going to just load me up with medications hospice i'm not going to know who i am or where what's going on and um uh, i don't i i want you to remember me as what i'm right now right uh so this is it like there's no additional visit um you know i'll have my family email you when i pass and things like that and but it was this thing too of like because she had said that um, when she did pass, she did die. Like I was much more, I don't know, at peace with, peace with it or I thought about it or, uh, um, but yeah, there was something, there was something to that. Um, but anyway, so it, the I-35 bridge thing is kind of, in, it, well, it is interesting because when I researched it for the book, I was, I was trying to come up with a short-term chaos events and I kind of, and then I found this ancillary study done by the Department of Transportation, Minnesota, where they're like, <laughs> You know what? Like people never came back to the bridge and it took years to convince people to come back to the bridge. And it wasn't that they didn't necessarily trust the bridge, the new bridge. It was because when you throw people into this plan B here, you got to figure out how to get around to your destination. We'll kind of get you across the river. The rest of it's up to you. Once they found that they were unwilling to give that up because it kind of felt like they you know, they had been thrown this curveball that they didn't expect and they weren't going to put themselves in that position again. I'm not going to put myself in a position where I trust this bridge and now it has to close or it falls down or something and I have to go through all this again. So I'm going to stick with this. Like this works 25 minutes a day more on my drive, but it works. So that's, and that's really interesting now as we wind down COVID restrictions of people 
who are saying, I'm not really coming back to the baseball games. I'm not coming back to the concert stuff. I'm not coming back to shopping without a mask or shopping during a prime time. I'll do my shopping at nine at night. And those behaviors, if you see those right now, you probably will see them for the rest of those people's lives. Like that is unlikely to change for the rest of their lives. Um, so not a, I'm not saying it's a good or bad. I'm just saying that's the way that it is. Like it's likely, you know, if they if they feel that those are the steps that they they need to to take, right? Um, they feel that this was thrown upon them very quickly. They woke up essential or non-essential one day, and this is what they have to do. They're not going to backtrack. They're not going to return to this pre-chaos Taurus or similarity or how things were before 2020. So they'll live out their entire life. You will always have family gatherings where they'll have a mask. They'll never shake your hand. They'll shop at nine o'clock at night. They probably won't be on an airplane again for the rest of their life, things like that. Um, so not trying to put this as a judgmental statement, just saying, as a result of the way that chaos was introduced into people's lives, some people will not return. Um, and these are people who would be like, I will never live in a city again, <laughs> right? I will never be in a position where, oh, I lived in Seattle. And the only, you know, I remember at a time when we were limited to two people or one people, one person in an elevator, and it would take me 60 minutes to, if I get in the lobby, I'd have to socially distance. It would take me 60 minutes to get up to my apartment, right? Which that was happening. So you will have some of these behaviors where they will not revert for the entire generation. So it's interesting, right? It's interesting in a big city where the big cities are built on mass transportation and, oh, don't have your individual cars. We'll have mass transit and all of that. But the reality is like there are a number of people who will not go back to mass transit ever. Or if they do, they'll they'll be like, I will take the last route of the bus 11 p.m. at night when there's only so many people on it. Um, so knowing that and I guess knowing how to interface with, with people like that and having empathy for people who, I don't know, I don't want to say empathy. It almost sounds like then you're, you're positioning yourself higher than they are. But understanding where they're kind of coming from. The, psych the psychology of this is if you've been introduced to chaos very rapidly without any warning, whatever you've assembled for yourself for a system to get through it is probably what you're going to stick with for a long time, if not the rest of your life. Even if things kind of revert to normal, it's like the Great Depression, right? So I wrote about this in my book. You know what? The, after the Great Depression was done, largely like 1939, there were still people well into the 60s and 70s, you know, generations that, that saved aluminum foil and saved lard and saved uh, scraps of um, cloth to make, you know, I, I don't know, quilts or whatever. I mean, it was it was very frugal mentality that was there for like a solid 34 years, 30 to 40 years later in this, these generational things. So the points coming out of that is is um, let people know ahead of time. And this whole thing, too, with the, the Braze paradox is, you know, if you anticipate or know kind of where these efficiencies have been engineered into your, your daily lives, um, because if things get stressed, like roads or stores or stuff like that, people are probably going to overwhelm the most efficient, maybe, roads and slow them down, right? Or the stores. So what are you, what is your second, your third, your fourth option to get out of a Braze paradox? Because um, the whole book of velocity of information is thinks you can get ahead of the pack and out of harm's way. If you can get, if you can think differently, counterintuitively than 90% of the people out there, you're going to be in good shape. So um, let's see here. This is a uh, New York Outcast. All they got to do is read the label on the box of the mask. So, which says what? It doesn't protect against it. <laughs> yeah, I see that too. What, what was it too? Like, well, get all these N95 masks out. And then I was kind of like, yeah, but don't they only last for like eight hours and you're supposed to get rid of them? So you have to turn these over at high rate. But um, yeah. Uh, bacon. I wonder how much extra gas electricity alone 
the TTR cost, let alone, right. I mean, from an efficiency standpoint, it's good bacon from, so from an efficiency and logistics standpoint, it doesn't make sense. So that's, so they, they interviewed a lot of people and they said, listen, like you could, save yourself money you could cut time off your commute and stuff like this and they'd be like nope <laughs> i'm not doing it so um and it was because this had been a sudden onset chaos event and they're like i don't trust it i like my system it's less likely in their opinion to have a catastrophic failure but you're you're right so one of the things coming out of that report from the minnesota department of transportation is how do we message to people to get them back to use like the bridge, right? How do, or, or when something catastrophic ha happens that we didn't anticipate, how do we get people back into our systems so they feel confident using them? So there's a big part of it, which is big. I talk about that a ton in the book, a lot in the velocity of information, the, the importance of messaging. And they flatly said it in these studies, we didn't message well enough with this. And this is, you know, we'd have to interview people, we'd have to figure out how to do this better to get people to return to these paths, which are more efficient, more efficient for the city. But um, yeah, it was, it was, I guess, more efficient to the city to an extent, because again, if, if you spread people out over more roads, that actually becomes more efficient. New York, Boston, Seoul, stuff like that. Um, Bolo said, a hug is a beautiful thing. Obviously. Thank you, Bolo. Simmer to begin institutionalized. So, yeah, New York Outcast. Uh, simmer to, similar to being inst institutionalized. Well, there's probably something to that, right? New York uh, Outcast. Of, I mean, when I interviewed Larry Lawton, America's Biggest Jewel Thief, on the show, and then also interviewed him for my book, so he's in the velocity of information, um, one of the things Larry talked about is, is he said, you know, being a prisoner, you know, a very like you know high max prison, you had, you have few choices to make during the day. You knew when to get up because you 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 know they they would wake you up at a certain time. What you're going to eat, what you're going to do, what your day was going to be. So your choices were very small, especially like if you were put into the hole, which was like a telephone booth in a darkened room. Um, so your when your 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 selections your choices come down you know very uh so i think there's some some ancillary some comparison here with that but i remember when i interviewed larry and he talked a, a couple things one is he said you know what he was put on a greyhound bus to, and sent home to florida when he was released from you know prison and so much money and they stopped at a gas station and there was a subway restaurant attached to this gas station and this was something like when he went to prison, like there was no subway at a gas station, like, you know, subway RV stuff like that just wasn't happening. Like it was a separate restaurant. So he goes there and he's in line. He's looking up at the menu and he's like overwhelmed, like chicken teriyaki, meatball, these toppings, whatever. Like he, these choices were just too much in prison. Like you don't get the choices. You're like, here's your food. So he said, you know, he actually contemplated like trying to harm somebody. So he would, be returned to prison where he didn't have to make these choices. He just wasn't used to making these choices. And after prison, he was out golfing with one of his friends. They had golf frequently, right? You know, every week for a couple of years. And and uh, the they would go to the clubhouse and do their order. And the person took Larry's order and Larry always ordered the same thing, like a, a club BLT or whatever it was. And Larry's friend like stopped him in mid sentence and said, no, like Larry, um, or, or you know, the the waiter, waitress, whatever hostess, please come back. And he said, Larry, I want you to read the whole menu. I want you to look at all the options available to you and then pick something different. You know, you have options. You don't have to stick with one thing. And, and so Larry talked about this and said, yeah, you know, like the thing was you stuck with the one thing um, because you, you weren't used to the options. So that was, that was fascinating uh, when he was, when he was sharing he was sharing that. Um, this is the bacon here. I guess I was going to make a comment about wanting my institutions to have a dry heat. So, wow. Sorry, my spelling sucks and I type fast. I try to retract. That's okay. I spell, I type poorly. <laughs> so, 
Yeah, it's interesting because like in my my books like look great, right? You know all that stuff because like there's editors that go through those things and and uh, you know even like my PBS presentations are really good, uh, but because they've been rehearsed several several times, like uh, sitting in front of this, timing things out and stuff like that. Um, but uh, Bacon, to, the Russians uh, went through the same thing after the USSR fell. Total choice paralysis. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. And when I interviewed Nikolai Razavayu and wrote about that end of last of information, which releases April 11th, um, Nikolai said, or, or so you're researching around Ukraine, Chernobyl, Kiev, these areas, and people kind of just have this paralysis. They're unwilling to invest because <laughs> they don't know if the whole area will be declared a nuclear hot zone and, you know, so that you have kind of this paralysis to move forward. You have this this area where people are just like, I'm not, I don't want to do, I don't want to invest a lot into my, you know, my property or what I'm doing around here because if this whole this whole exclusionary zone could be pushed out and then I could lose it all. So you have kind of this lost generation where they're like, I'm not going to do any of this stuff. So you're like, um, yeah, which is a pretty hard way to live. Um, so yeah, let me check over here on my notes. So I have three monitors for those of you watching at home. Um, the front monitor is the show. I see myself right here. The right monitor is the, um, is the show as it appears in YouTube. So I can see, <laughs> make sure like it's, I'm like, if it's not over here, it's bad. So uh, and then the left are my um, show notes. Um, so, yeah. So that's where I'm pulling from now. So, yeah, this is really, this is really good. Um, just pulling this up. So, so to, re to recap a few things. I appreciate we have, we have 14 viewers right now, which is very good for the show. Appreciate that you follow the show. So here with our banners here. Yeah. So, it's, you know, we're 27 thumbs up, which is great. I appreciate that. This is episode 169. Um, episode 171, I have the locksmith on, which is going to be great. You throw any questions out there you want for locksmith. And then uh, I'm not sure next week. Next week, I start to get into the velocity of information where I'm going to spend a number of shows breaking down chapters in that. So that will start next week. Um, and again, for those of you who have not purchased this book or have purchased it, haven't left a review, please, uh, School of Errors, you know, it's 30 books, 30 bucks, 30 books, 30 bucks on Amazon. It's actually stayed that way. So inflation-wise, it's, it's worth it. It's a very well-made book, right? It's got a sewn spine. Um, but this is not only just school safety. There's you know, chapters in here where I worked with the New York Department of Planning. Like we analyzed the 9-11 rescue of 500,000 people in nine hours. How did that happen? And the reality is it happened because there was this thing called psychological transference dynamic where it was really how people were raised in the 80s that um, impacted how they performed in this rescue in 2001. But it's a fascinating book. It's also punchy. It's entertaining. Um People email me for years. Like they love this book, right? It's in hundreds of libraries across the the world. If you're a taxpayer, if you're a parent, if you know somebody who's a teacher, like it's the book to have. And it also gives insight onto what is really happening with all this crazy pandemic stuff right now. How schools are trying to adapt to that. It's a lot of insight into that. Um, so let's go. You know, let's go through. Um, why is that camera pointed toward the floor? I don't know, Andrew. I don't know what is happening on that. So uh, that's funny. It's a proven fact that Doc's book has more of a spine than most people. Yeah. You know what? Um, I I always, I said on the, when I released the book, um, the book was a huge professional risk for me. And those of you who've read the book, um, it, you'd quickly identify, like if you're writing this as a school administrator and kind of talking about here's a professional standards for educators and here's how it completely ignores school safety and here's why, 
you know, school schools get inundated with vendors who try to sell them bollards and successfully do in most cases, and they don't make schools safer. Like I wrote about all, all that stuff. So I was anticipating backlash. It was at a time I was retiring. Um, and, but I'll tell you what, I mean, I receive emails weekly, right? From people around the world who say, thank you so much for writing this book. Uh, the book is, is extremely well cited. It is necessary. I'm, ex I'm thrilled to be the one who's narrating it, that it will be available in audiobook uh, later this year. I never thought that would happen. And thankfully, you know, my publishers worked um, to make that happen uh, by uh, reverting the rights back to me. But um, yeah, it is It is one of those things where, you know, you can't, because you're going to get pushback, right? You're going to get, it's, it hasn't come without consequence. I was, I don't know, I, I wouldn't say the word banned, but I was not allowed to present at a state conference because of the book. Um, I lost a, a large conference um, keynote because of the book. Um, and, and largely because people would say, you talk about, you know, bollards and surveillance cameras and things in here of being like, you know, this isn't the path of true school safety. But yet, like at our conference, our bollard vendor is paying us $20,000. So we can't have you do this. Um, so it's, you know, it's one of those things. But um, uh, has it cost me any sleep? No. Has, if you know the doc, you guys do. Um, pretty broad shoulders here. Like, yeah. Um, the book itself is extremely well written, well cited, well researched. So, um, at that point, like you know, nobody, nobody has really you know tried to undermine the efficacy of the book because I don't think you can, right? Because it's very well assembled in those aspects, but it's not popular with contemporary. Oh, you know, we're going to get funding, so let's put in some cameras and bollards. Um, but anyway, I'm glad I wrote it. I absolutely love that I wrote it. I can't, I'm thrilled that it's coming out. I'll be the one to narrate an audio. So you get to hear the angry old man voice narrate that book. Um, so, on the, oh, why is, it, why is the camera point to the floor on the camera? It's a good, yeah, I didn't write the publisher, um, put this right. The camera's pointing at the floor. So it's a good question. I know no one has ever asked me that before. Why is this? surveillance camera pointed toward the floor so there's this kid back here who's all blurred out you know and uh this looks like a student i used to work with <laughs> so it's kind of crazy so i'm like hey i think i know that guy but you know this wasn't it was just like a, a getty image i think that they bought but right why the hell is the camera point at the floor andrew picked that up first one uh maybe it's a foot a foot model could be you don't know what's happening there it was back in the old days of foot identification. It was pretty big back in 2019. We'll identify you by your feet. Um, so, yeah. So, some developments here. One is um, not really development, but the velocity of information, which I wish I couldn't hold up the book, which I don't have, um, releases April 13th. And that book is uh, available and Hard, it's expensive in hard copy because they're aiming to put it into libraries, but it is affordable in paperback or ebook, and it will be released in audio, but uh, later on. That's just part of the contract gig. So, um, Philosophy of Information is an awesome book, 471 endnotes. But if you're like, oh, God, a lot of citations, they're all at the end of the chapters. So, when you read, it's just like number one, number two, number three, number four, like for citations, it doesn't disrupt it at all. You don't have to read the end notes unless you care about it. So it's, you know, 10 interviews, fascinating stuff. Um, it's a brisk pace. And these are people who, again, are, these are hard to interview people. These are people who do not give interviews for other people. Larry Lawton is not going to give an interview. Linda Stone, um, Robert Travis. These are people, Aaron Sawyer, who like, I was able to work and build up the trust and get an interview with them. You're not going to find 10 other interviews out there with these people. So yeah, it is. The book is, is awesome. That book is professionally uh, narrated by a, an actor. There'll be more coming out on that. I just, I can't release all of that stuff that's happening right now. So like I've had to prepare the book for narration, which is interesting because um, then you go in, I go in the PDF of the book and then I'll be like, um, don't narrate the notes or like, here's how to pronounce this person's name. Or like, 
I will put a link to a YouTube video, which is unlisted or like private. And I'll be like pronouncing this person's name. Like this is how to pronounce her name. And, and so there's a lot to that, like what you do. And then there's this whole PDF companion document. So I have like the uh, citations in there and some of the, the graphics that I created or I created with um, my graphic designer who worked with me. So those are available. Then the other, the crazy stuff too, like you can't do those in like Times New Roman font or stuff. You have to do them in a Google font because a Google, any Google font is commercial use. Um, no copyright. If you use Times New Roman in Microsoft, you have to obtain a copyright if you're distributing that in a paid format. So it's so all the stuff you know, but it's good. Like I'm learning this it's really well put together, stuff like that. But um, so the so School of Air is released in 2019. This was kind of a weird thing because then the pandemic hit and it was kind of a a year of a lost year, even though the book did sell well and now it's also selling well into 2022. It's like my publisher got a hold of me and said, We're releasing it in paperback, which is it was released in hard copy and ebook. So now paperback is a more affordable point. I would guess somewhere in a $20 range. I don't know whatever they're going to do, but because hard copy is 30. So I mean, ebook or paperback would probably be about 20. Then, um, then the whole audio book will be less than that, which I'm recording at a professional studio in my town. And that will be out in August. So the book will be out in all of those formats. And then the velocity of information is also all those formats. And a lot of you know, like I have a, I have a few friends who are blind, right? So, you know, they'll be like, Dave, like we can do ebook reader, but it's not the same. So will you have your books narrated? I'm like, I'm working on it. And so like velocity of information is narrated as part of the contract. And then, um, School of Errors now will be narrated by me, um, which I'm looking forward to. I'm also, I wouldn't say I'm intimidated by it. I'm just like, I'm not, it's new, right? I've never done this before. So, but thankfully, like the studio, you know, they have been around 20 years, guy, like, we've done this, like, so, you know, and, and that has, uh, so that has fewer, the chapters aren't very long. So, and I, because I, School of Errors is really written where I'm talking to you. Velocity of Information is written where I start to talk to you and then I turn it over to like the 10 people interview. So it's a great book. It's a different style though. So it lends itself more to a professional narr narrator where School of Errors will work really well for me to narrate it because I'm pretty much talking to the reader throughout the whole book, the recipient anyway, if that makes any sense. So I'm, I'm thrilled by it. Um, that yeah so this is both you'll hear my voice and i don't know if my voice is a good radio voice although like i've had a number of people tell me that and you know i listen to myself on pbs and things like that and i you know and whatever i mean the book's been the book will have been out there through three years at that point it released 8 17 2019 so i'm looking to release the audio book on the 30 year anniversary um but i think there is value in nonfiction to have the author narrate it. And again, I'm thrilled with who is narrating the velocity of information. Uh, I would never be able to do what they're capable of bringing that to. But, you know, with, with School of Errors, I think it's, and there's a legacy thing, which is really cool, where, again, if it's my kids or grandkids or people down the road are like, hey, you know, you know, what did, what did, Docs sound like, you know, 70 years from now when Doc's not around anymore. Well, here it is. Like, here's a book that Doc had out in audiobook. And I, I think there's a really cool point. And I like to listen to audiobooks that are narrated, nonfiction that are narrated by the author. Um, and John Ronson is one of my favorites, for example. So I think that's going to, to go pretty well because I think people, it's not a very long book either. So I think people are going to to resonate very well. I think, I, I just think there's win, 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 win all around this. I'm excited to do it. Um, it's, I had been asking my publisher for years to revert this to me and, you know, they finally had agreed and things. Hey, is our good friend Walter P380. Hello, Walter. So, um, so yeah, I've, you know, I've got those big things coming up. And then, as I said, I'm shifting the podcasts to, talk about top topics, chapters specifically in philosophy of information. So we're going to go through, there's be some book reads, be really cool. Two weeks from today though, I have a locksmith on. So any questions you can start thinking about for a locksmith, 
go for it. You know, put them, I mean, put them in discussion threads, email me or whatever, and I'll make sure that I have those available. Um, you know, like what's the, you know, I don't know. Like, what do you, what would be three things you could try if you're locked out of some place that might get you in like legitimately <laughs> if you're supposed to be there. Right. Um, and then also if you're trying to protect property and you're choosing locks, like what are, what are some things you should consider or look, look at, um, what are, what are mistakes? What are some things you get called as a locksmith for which you arrive and you're like, come on, you gotta be kidding me. Like this was something you did. So, um, yeah. Yeah, And it's cool because like he had contacted me and wanted to be on, on my show here. So that's really cool. So, um, you know what? I, I wish, um, I wish StreamYard would do kind of like what OBS does where the chat comes up a lot, you know, while you're reading, um, you know what I'm saying? Like OBS does, does. So the chat is on the one side of the screen, like pop turns, pop, uh, old Lumble stuff like that. Um, Maybe they'll do it. I would guess StreamYard is going to kind of evolve into some different models, but I, I don't necessarily like when I bring chat up and it covers part of me in the screen because I, I, I think it's better if it's it's kind of highlighted off to the to the side. So, um, so hey Bolo, keep playing, keep playing the channel. I'm I'm uh, over like twenty two hundred watch hours, so get to four thousand, we can monetize. Keep it going on your devices, buddy. Uh, it's not the book that's Doc show you have planned. <laughs> so it's funny. So yeah, my publisher initially did not want to release uh school of airs audio rights to me. And I don't say it as, as a diss to my publisher, but when I wrote, when I signed my first publishing contract, so getting a publishing contract is not easy, right? Um, with a traditional publisher, because then your book is in libraries across the world and things like that. Um, so with that, I did I did not sign for audio rights. I never thought about it back in 2000, I don't know, 16 when I wrote, when I signed the contract or 2017. The book came out in 2019. Um, so then, you know, people have asked me, is it an audio book? And I'm like, no. Can it be an audio book? I don't know. So I contacted the publisher and they're like, well, you know, we have the rights to do audiobook if we want to. I said, well, you do, but will you, if you're not releasing an audiobook, like at least give me a chance to get it out there in audio. And in the last uh, couple of weeks, you know, we went back and forth to the point where they said, we'll, re we'll revert the audio rights to you. By the way, when I did the velocity of information, you know, then I, it was a different way. I knew what to how to um, negotiate the contract for that, right? So all of that stuff was right up front and put together. But um, so I went back and I said, well, you know, it's been almost three years, school of errors, people still ask, and will you revert the audio rights? And they said, yes, but you have to be the one that narrates it. So, so, so instantly I've got to be the narrator, which actually I think is a cool thing. I think down the road, that's going to be, so then I had to go and try to find these, these places, the studios that could work. Cause, um, you know, I'm not going to narrate it here with my, my Yeti USB mic and try to level stuff and professionally do that. So when I was able to get, um, what's well, cool, Polo, when you read it, hear my voice. So you'll actually, I think when you hear me narrate it, and by the way, I will get you a free copy of the audio. I will have a number of credits I can distribute out when that comes out. Um, it is, oh, what was it saying? But um, to, yeah, to have the audio, again, and when I was talking to the public trust, I've, I used to work at the School for the Blind for four years. To not have an audio version of my book is really contraindicated to my professional work. <laughs> As a professor in teaching non-discrimination, accessibility, to not have my book in audio is, is kind of goes against that. Um, and, and so, you know, we got to this point and so I'm thrilled and they said, you know, you can do it, but you got to narrate it. And however you just decide to distribute it through distributor, which I already have a distributor, um, that's, you know, that's all set up. But, uh, and, and I was talking to my wife and I said, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to do it. And locally we have a nice, um, studio again, that's been around for 20 years. It's a couple of miles from my house. They're excited to do this project and. They've done stuff like this before, um, and and uh, so so yeah. I mean, I'll be going into the studio Wednesday morning to start this, 
and recording the the book, you know, and then they'll do the finishing, you know, on it and making sure it's all all good and and stuff like that. And um, but yeah, I mean, it's kind of crazy stuff, right? Like, I would have I wouldn't have thought this a few years ago, like ten years ago. God, I would have never thought it. I would have written two books. I mean, I was on PBS. What I don't know, twenty thirteen. So I guess almost ten years ago. But um, that I'd be, you know, two times PBS, two times the books, um, and then also like recording my own audio book. Um, today, the publisher sent me the um, sent me the cover for the book, so that's going into print. I can bring it up here just a second, and uh, basically said, "Is there anything here? This is the cover. Anything that's we need to." to revisit here before this starts go to starts into production. Um, so I'm going to bring up the cover here. What, what the hell the hell's going on here? You wouldn't believe the files when you write a book, like I've got, I mean, a hundred files for this thing. Yeah. All right. Here we go. Okay. Let me make this bigger. Okay. I'm going to switch, switch screens. So, um, wait, I just, this is New York. I just finished uh, Shackleton's great voyage last week. I listen to books often and multitask for my day. I prefer real information. Yeah. I love audiobooks. I don't like have a, a commute. So I did when I was working at the School for the Blind. I listened to Aaron Clary like all the time, <laughs> Stefan Molyneux. And, uh, but I now, you know, I, I, when I bike, I have a speaker and an old Samsung S5. So I forget what the speaker is, but I, it's like an indoor outdoor. It's a, like a beach speaker. So it'll stay charged for like four or five hours. Like it'll it'll play for four or five hours and it's made for outdoors. It works really well. And I have that old Samsung that I will download my or put my audio over and listen to podcasts and stuff. So if I'm up for a hundred mile ride is maybe I don't know eight nine hours, and then um, with breaks and all that, I usually will will on my way back um, throw on some podcasts and stuff. So just because I kind of get bored. Um, so yeah. So I don't. I think the book will be about six hours total of finish time. Velocity of information will be about seven. Um, how long are you scheduled to finish your recording? So we're going to figure that out on Wednesday. So I will because the studio is close, right, in my hometown, and the book. I think Velocity of Information. I don't know. It's like thirty-three chapters or something. Um, we will aim. We'll put together a schedule. And, and I basically, I said, I, I want to have this done by August so I can launch it on the three-year anniversary. So there's a lot of time. And um, I would guess, like, Bacon, I would have maybe two hours in the studio at a time. So maybe, you know, that we would record three to four chapters at a time. And again, like, they have all their, you know, it's regular studio, right? There's like leveling stuff, and it's all you know, rendered so it doesn't have, um, so it meets all the requirements for the audio distributors. But, um, but yeah, I have to go in, I have to do a little work on my side. I have to go into the document as a PDF and then it has to be in a screen. So like a tablet that I can swipe through it. And then um, what I did for philosophy of information is I spent a couple of weeks with the PDF and I, I noted things for the narrator. And I said, here's how to pronounce this word or like, don't pr forget the notes or forget this figure or for this figure. Yes, you have to read this figure because it's a admir admiralty scale. And if you don't read what's in this figure, it's not going to make any sense to the reader. So and then like I touched base with the narrator and everything was good. Um, so I do know how to do that. I figure it'll take me two weeks to fully do that. So so Wednesday is largely figuring out like my my speaking rate my volume and breaking down as you said with the with the um recording studio how long this will take like how many sessions we anticipate this will take um so yeah and then you know 
they've got some, you know, will I stand when I'm doing this? Am I going to stand or am I going to sit or like, you know, those things we're going to take some audio samples on Wednesday. I, I think it's going to be better if I stand when I, when I deliver these. So, and then the kind of like, what's your threshold? And I think my threshold will be like a two hour session. I don't think I'd want to go beyond that. Um, but so yeah, it's cool. It's cool stuff. Um, my dad is going deaf. Yelling doesn't help learning how to communicate still. Sorry to hear that below. Um, I've done 40 miles in about four hours once, but that was a long time ago. New York outcast biking. So yeah, I don't bike for speed. Um, well, I, yeah, I don't. Sometimes I shouldn't say it. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I'll go out and I'll be like, I want to maintain 25 miles an hour for, you know, a mile and then like down into like 18 for another mile and then up to 25 or to try to like get my blood flow and heart rate. But um, when I do, I don't do a hundred miles at the start of the season. My first ride will be 30, 35, you know, a couple of those and 40, 45, 50. And once you get up to like 70, 70, the, the, for me, the jump between 70 mile bike ride and a hundred isn't a big deal. And people will also say, well, if it's really hot, like, does that slow you down? I'm like, actually, it doesn't. The hotter it is, the better it is for me to bike. Personally, I think my muscles stay looser. Um, I I tend to understand hydration well. Like, I would much rather do a 100-mile ride on a 90-degree day than a 70-degree day. <laughs> Seven days of the week. Um and once you, the, the thing is, and, and you, and I don't cramp up because I understand, you know, electrolytes and all of that. Like I really got this down to a science. Um, but I, I absolutely, um, just love those long treks. And I know, I know, I know ahead of time where I'm going, like I've all, you know, mapped out and stuff like that. And, and um, there is, there is something, um, uh, cathartic to your mind when you, when you do that. And I've, you know, I've gotten to the point where then I come home, I can get off the bike and, you know, do all the wind down stuff I need, like take all the stuff off the bike and all the lights, like, <laughs> you know, all the lights have to charge. And then usually they stay charged throughout the ride. Sometimes I have to replace them out with other, like uh, I have a little flashing headlight, a little flashing light on my helmet and stuff like that for the back. But um, I can walk in the house grab a shower and be fine. Like I could go out that night and run or do anything. I, it doesn't wipe me out. It's so, it's so amazing, but I, uh, it's weird because like Wisconsin from April to October, you can bike. And then after that, you're pretty much screwed. So like right now I feel like everything I've gained from biking, I lose. Like I was suntan fit, like, you know, probably weigh 15, 20 pounds less, but, uh, uh, no, I absolutely, I absolutely love distance biking, getting up in the morning and, uh, uh, I don't know. I'm just, I am going to, like I said, I haven't shared that with you too much because I haven't taken videos when I bike. So I'm going to take some videos to show you some of the, you know, and I'll, condense, I'll edit those like, right. I'll, here's how I do some of the prep stuff when I get out there and here's some of the places I go and I'll show, I'll, I'll take you to the thousand year old effigy mounds that I bike past. We'll, we'll walk past, we'll go through those. Um, I'll, I will, I'll take you right along with me and show you the farms, you know, with the barns from the 1860s and stuff like, you know, the, that are still the family farms and, uh, the, the cranes and the fields and stuff like that. Um, you know, I'll take you through everything and, uh, you know, condense it down. So it's really great. It's, and it's something too, where I don't know, again, how many of you really know, but I didn't bike, um, when I was, um, when I was, oh God, 40, so I'm 50 right now. When I was 40, the most I biked was probably, I don't know. I, I used to bike like 10 miles in college quite a bit. We had trails around the campus. like So I would bike quite a bit. I had a heavy steel truck bike, but um, back in the 1990s, um, maybe 10 miles. And, you know, but when I was 40, I could bike three to five miles before I'd be wiped out, exhausted, just mentally fatigued, didn't care for it. And then like, I just, 
it was the summer of 2014. I was like, I'm going to just try. I don't know if I could bike 20 miles. I'm going to try it. So I tried it. I biked 20 miles. And I'm going to try to bike 30 miles and 40. And then and then suddenly I just, I just boom, I fell in love with biking. Uh, Bacon said, it, it, it's only that uh, Utah moving at a decent clip. Uh, you have a wind to help you. So yeah, I don't like biking on windy days. If it's... Um, if it's cold, I guess if it's warm, you don't usually get windy days when it's 90 out. But I hate, I don't like wind because the helmet, your bike helmet, um, you just get a lot of shh coming through the the helmet. Um, because it's meant to circulate air, you know, and cool you down. And I don't, I don't care for windy days. My, uh, this is from Walter. My college roommate sucker me into a 70 mile cold turkey ride on a Schwinn varsity, so small that my knees hit the handlebars. Can walk the next day. Oh, god, yeah, I remember those. So, yeah, honest, and I, I, when I'm conditioned, when I've already had, you know, a month of rides and it doesn't affect me, I don't get up the next day feeling sore or like that night or stuff, but it's just, I've learned, I put the research in and I've learned how to pack the foods to eat, the things to do before. I mean, I, when I start, if I, if I'm going to do a hundred mile bike ride tomorrow, like I'm already eating certain foods today and prepping for that. <laughs> Like well ahead of time, um, and really, you know, super hydrating uh, myself uh, for that. So this is to Walter. I've ridden bikes. I couldn't get full leg extension. I don't know. Yeah, that's why. Like, I mean, so like, I take my bike to a professional bike shop, and uh, you know, we always kind of do the refitting every year, and just to. In addition, like I have the bike fully checked out every year, like because part of the bike is uh, uh, what graphite frame, so like any cracks in that can be catastrophic, and at some point, like that will give way. Um, so it, what it does, though, it absorbs shock really well, but graphite tends to break versus bend. So if I'm thinking correctly, but yeah, my so that stuff i really have the bike checked out thoroughly by a professional i can do a lot on the bike but like i don't know like they have equipment where they do like sonar stuff to check like the forks and the integrity of stuff like that so um i'm going to have a bike a new bike built in the next one or two years not this season but uh and i'm going to have them build it from scratch that's a big that'd probably be like seven grand to have that done but the other thing is like, so seven grand in a bike that may last you 20 years um, versus like, you know, I don't drive a snowmobile and I don't have these other jet ski stuff like that. It's, it's health, right? Every time I go out there, I'm getting healthier. But yeah, um, I've ridden bikes and get fully West Virginia PA 70 with a little, little flat. So yeah, it's, it's, I don't know, man. I, you know, I've got a lot of pictures I post in summer and, um, when I'm out riding and it is, it is this, the psychological wonderland. And as I, as I share, I think, um, your brain, when I bike my, it takes me about 20 miles before my brain kind of disconnects from everything I've been thinking about for the week. And then things just spill out and you just start to realize, Oh, here's like corn that's, you know, growing next to me. And here's some, cranes and here's you know whatever and, and you just you get removed and there's this amazing solitude solitude surfer right this guy but um there there is this component which people miss out on where and time kind of means nothing like it doesn't it doesn't matter to me if i get home at four o'clock or six o'clock or early seven as long as there's light but um you just yeah, I'm not talking like this. Is, this is one thing I get. A lot of people ask me, they'll be like, hey, like, um, could we ride with you? Like people will say uh, in my area and I'll be like, no. <laughs> and it's not because I don't like you, but I do not want to talk to anybody when I'm riding. I don't want to keep pace with anybody when I'm riding. I don't want to wear a headset when I'm riding. Um, I just this is my own thing. Like and I don't I kind of know where I'm going, but I might change things up. And I just it's I know. <laughs> Um, so I can, I'll show you where I ride. You can use these routes. These are awesome. Go for them, you know, go and do all that. But I, I am not going to do a hundred mile ride with anybody. Um, 
ever look at can i have yes absolutely have yep um candale bikes my favorite bike mechanic was in korea he fixed everything with a hammer my bike mechanics this guy's been doing this for 30 years and they both they wear suits with skinny ties kind of like the blues brothers it's kind of a thing they get going on they got a bike shop um so you know they know everything right and they not only service bikes but they build custom bikes that's where you get into like that six seven plus thousand dollar range so and again i'm kind of there like part of it is my age like right i'm retired and i want that and i do bike and i I love bike i'd like to have a more um a bike i could do a little more speed on because my current my current bike you know is is meant to it's it's the uh jeep right it's meant to put everything on it's heavy it's loaded down I love it, but I'd like to be able to switch up and say, I just want a bike that I can do 30 miles an hour on for 50 miles. Like that I can just fly. Um, and that's not my current bike. So I'd like to have like a, a way to kind of change those things up. So, um, and I had rims built. I don't know. I might've shared this a couple of years ago, but when I had the new rims built for my bike, I mean, that was expensive. I think it, it cost, it cost a lot. It took like two days for the dudes to build the rims for my bike. They built them by hand and built rims. So, um, but anyway, yeah, they build everything here. Every, every, everything on my bike is built right here. Um, and everything has been rebuilt or else they've they manufactured it themselves. Um, so I'm in the greater Madison area. So there's kind of these niche Madison, Wisconsin, bike manufacturers here uh learn my lesson having a rigid frame made of aircraft aluminum next one i'm going to get full suspension current bike has yeah i'm i don't know there isn't there's no suspension on the bike there's a you know like the forks are carbon and everything so it absorbs quite a bit um so i guess where i would feel it is more like through the wrist and forearms on my bike because i do a fair amount of the vibration that comes up so that's probably the sorest it's not, you know, from calves or hamstrings or anything from pedaling. It's probably just vibration from the the road vibration that's coming in through the frame. But and plus, I'm old. Damn it, my bike has the the head check. Yeah, I would definitely, if I were to have a bike built, it would be with uh, suspension qualities in it. My daughter has an awesome bike, a Harrow which was made in California with a full suspension mountain bike. It's better than my bike. She doesn't drive it that much. I'm like, holy God, that is incredible. That is, uh, that is an amazing bike. You find the zone, the sweet spot, everything uh, fades away. But the, yeah, it's true. Like the time, the, uh, the best uh, psychological, um, uh, I, I, I would say, evacuations, I, that's a poor way to put it. Um, a freeing, a liberation of your mind is uh, 25 miles out, 25 miles into a 100 mile bike ride. You just stop thinking about things. You and then you just start like you're just. I don't. It's it's hard to explain. I love it. It takes 20 miles though to kind of rid yourself of everything that's you're just thinking of or that's going on, and then just become part of the ride. Um, for mental health, like it's, it's incredible. And just for physical health, right? I mean, it's, I go to my doctor and I have a doctor's appointment coming up in two weeks, which I, I don't know. I don't know if I dread it. I don't dread it, but obviously in winter, I'm not out biking. I don't have the same physical profile weight and all the stuff that I do in summer. So, right. You know, like this whole thing, like in summer, you're in great shape and in winter, you're not in great shape. So I'm like, that's the way it is. I live in Wisconsin. So, um, I'm guessing everyone is is different in your outcast. It's very med. It is meditative. It is very meditative, Jim. Um, there's a Zen of biking. Um, with without a without a doubt, and your how close you are to nature. I mean, deer, turtles. Um, we have sandhill cranes. I remember like I was biking a year or two ago, and like hundreds of sandhill cranes on the road, and I just had to wait. It's kind of like Polar Express when they wait for the elk or whatever the hell to get off the track. 
And then they just kind of cleared out. And then I just kept biking. And I'm like, wow, you know. Um, but it is, yeah, it is a meditative thing. And uh, I, I, I just, I don't think people do it enough. Um, and I think there is something said, at least for me, to not be around other people. Um, when you do these types of things, I think there is there is a big quality for not having to continually keep your mind engaged in a conversation or monitoring somebody else or whatever. Like there's times for that. I get it. But it's like that's biking for me. Is like, I don't know. And I have to try to explain that to people in a way that doesn't hurt their feelings. I'm like, it's not that I don't like you. It's just that when I and it's not that I don't think you can bike 100 miles. But again, I this is something it's solo. I I do not want to talk. I do not want to monitor anybody else. I want to stop when I need to stop. I want to go at the pace that I want to go. And so um, I don't know. I, I haven't biked with anybody in a long time. Um, so, yeah. Um, I bet it was pricey to build a wheel set, hand lacing. It was. It was costly as hell. <laughs> and uh, it's held up well, um, really well. And then every year I take it in and then they tune the um, they tune the spokes on that and they true the they true the rim. But it was expensive. Yes. It's worth I mean it's expensive relatively speaking, right? Because so I'm biking and I'm building up my health, my physical health, my mental health, and all of that. And put you know, I'm not having to buy gas for it or anything like that. I do all my own maintenance on the bike during the season. So from that aspect, I like it's a huge positive. Um, so yeah, the old Schwinn homegrown are great, especially if you're a, uh, so I had a couple of Schwins, Yeah. So um, I try to write every day until it gets hot out. And so Heath said, well, Heath subscribe to this channel, by the way. Um, that's awesome. I don't know what hot out is by you, but I don't, it would take quite a bit for me to not bike because of heat. It would be something called um, the wet bulb effect. The humidity would have to be up so high that if you biked, your sweat wouldn't evaporate, which then your body heats up and you could die. Like, I wouldn't do that. But I love biking in 90-degree weather. Absolutely. And I remember, like, I'll bike in 90-degree weather. There'll be people out biking and they'll bike. They might be on a much shorter trek than I'm at. And they, they always will say like, Hey dude, are you okay? But you're like, yeah, I'm, uh, my body's built for this and I, I'm fine. Like I'm really like, I'm good. Thanks for asking. (laughs) But that is everybody like is real worried about you. They're not worried about you when you just mangled in the middle of a road after an accident, you know, like I was there, but if it's 90 degrees, like they'll pull over and be okay. I'm I'm good. Like I choose to be out here. It could be a natural high. So yeah, hiking. You're right. Yeah, I did a hike. Um, I did a hike last week, which was a little misleading because it was like 40 degrees. And I, when you hike, right, everything is snow and there's a little bit of a wind. So the wind is coming over the snow. So the authentic temperature was probably closer to 25. So that pissed me off a little bit. It wasn't the hike that I thought it was going to be. So I, I was cold. I was underdressed for the hike and I wasn't heating up where it would offset that. But yeah, so you're right. Hiking, hiking, um, too. Um, Jim McIntosh, uh, you don't have a machine to stay in shape. And I don't, I used to have a stand for my bike. Um, so I could bike, but then I was like, I didn't want to do that anymore. And I don't, I, I used to, go and walk. We have a, the high school track is two blocks from my house. Now in, in winter, of course, it's snow covered. So it kind of sucks to walk snow covered track. Um, and I do walk and hike kind of in my area. There's a hiking trail that's not too far away, but no, there's really no, nothing close to that. So basically I am healthy from April to November, from December to March, it's just the way that it is. Things shut down. Hey, it's cold and I don't like being outside. Uh, Baking a gym. Perhaps over long haul, personally, I don't like riding bikes. You're physically attached to. Keep in mind, most of my riding days are in L.A. It's like, yeah, I don't. 
it's quick for me to get out of the city here and then like I'm riding where I might not see somebody else for an hour or two hours once I really get out. So that is a big advantage to what I, the routes that I choose. 150. Yeah, no, I've never tried anything like that. So we'd have to see. <laughs> I, I don't think I'd be against trying it. I don't know, but you're right. At that point, like I don't know, a 100 mile bike ride in 115 degree temperature might not. I'll tell you though, like if I died biking, uh, everybody could say he went out doing what he likes. Um, so he was a camelback. It's really out filled with ice. Yeah, yeah. So I do. I, I mean, I, I will pack almost two gallons of water, which is 16 pounds um, when I do hot weather bikes. And plus I'm hydrated like crazy before that. So um, LA sounds as bad as Detroit these days. Yikes. Heath, that is hot. I refuse to be anywhere without outside AC or that hot. Vitamin C, right? Your or vitamin D in your body. Cross country skis. I haven't done that in a long time. Keep, yeah, it's very hot for three months a year, but no snow. Yeah, we have snow, not a lot of snow here, but of course it doesn't melt because it's like very cold. And then just the cold is the one of the problems is like our so I live in the second oldest city in Wisconsin. So there are very few sidewalks. Um and when you try to walk, it's just, it's icy. So you, I mean, like every other walk, I will fall, like I'll slide. And this is not because I'm old. Like it's just something forever. And you learn, you know, to kind of roll into the fall and nothing serious, but there's just not any good place to walk or do stuff in winter around here, like for physical, like they do have this big, and we have gyms and stuff like that and stuff. Like that. So I don't know. Maybe I got to revisit that. But I did do that. I I, bike, I, I, I uh, would walk five miles on the track every winter, every day in winter. But at some point, I'm like, just screw this. <laughs> so, But I st start melting past 100 degrees. Uh, you don't want to be anywhere near the melting. Uh, yeah. And actually, like for the bike, I think the bike at a certain temperature, the, the tires... I don't know how they would hold up on the bike or even the asphalt. Um, I don't know. Like, I don't, we really don't have that issue here in Wisconsin. I mean, you're probably hitting nineties. You're not getting into hundreds. So it's interesting though. Um, keep in mind very little hum humidity is the thing. That's what's called the wet bulb factor. So wet bulb factor is if you take a thermometer, wrap it in a muslin cloth and it's wet, how, and you, have it evaporate in a breeze and then measure the temperature. If it evaporates and drops the temperature, then it's okay to be out, right? Because if you're out and sweating, your sweat is going to be evaporate and cool your body. If it doesn't change temperature in this wet bulb, then you shouldn't be out. So there's this whole wet bulb thing, which I kind of learned, but it doesn't apply much up here. Like there's a few days, like I'll be like, well, I'm not going to bike on this day because it's, you know, <laughs> Usually there's a coupling in there. Like there's a high chance of severe weather. I don't want to be out 70 miles and a tornado comes down or something like that. Uh, I built my street bike for out acceleration and all out acceleration and maneuverability. If that tells you something, bulletproof tires. That's crazy. It's great. So I have a number of bikes where, yeah. Um, I start with the strappy pedals. Go brand. You just kick your heels and detach the clipless just to twist your feet. Yep. Actually, and I don't do clips. I don't, um, I just, I did for a while and I just don't, but I have bike shoes, you know, right? Um, I just don't, I just don't like to do clips. And the reason you do bike shoes for those of you listening uh, and wondering about this, you do not want to put your energy of pedaling into a cushioned shoe because your, your energy goes into flattening the cushion down like a running shoe. You never bike in a running shoe <laughs> if you're serious about biking because your energy goes into the cushioning. So after a while, you're just wasting this energy and you're, you're, it's bad for your calves, your muscles and all this. Stuff. It's going to, you're not going to have an enjoyable ride. So a biking shoe is, is like cardboard, like compressed cardboard on the bottom. Um, so there's no, really no padding in a biking shoe because the energy goes straight from your shoe onto the pedal, straight from your foot onto the pedal. So it's kind of like a bowling shoe. Think about that. A biking shoe is very much like a bowling shoe. So that is, that's a difference. Um, but yeah, I had, a, I had a friend of mine who was like, oh, you know, so biking, whatever. And I'm like, well, what are you using for shoes? And 
you know, like a whatever. I'm like, well, that's a running shoe for God's sake. You can use that. Like, that's not going to get you more than 10 or 15 miles. Like your calves will fatigue and stuff like that doesn't work. You have to, your energy has to go directly into the pedals. Um, so um, my bike loses a lot in rear suspension. It's primitive. So I guess my bike is kind of, it's not new. It works. Uh, this is the bacon. I've tried them before. I just learned how to do the same thing. You do with clips and pedals and just need pedals and shoes. Enough grip. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just not a clip. I'm just not a clip person. I've never had an issue of sliding my feet, sliding off the pedals. Um, you know, you can angle, you can angle your feet in if you're on an incline, right. Or going down, like there's things you can do to position your, your feet and kind of, uh, the wedge of the shoes to to keep traction so you don't slide off. So I don't know. This is all things you kind of learn over time. I mean, we go back like years. People didn't have this technology. So this is the, um, I was going to bring this up before, but this is the cover of the book. So the publisher sent this to me a day ago. So the right is no surprise. Those of you who have been following my channel, that's we decided upon that in I don't know months ago. I still have the original over on the tape to the wall. There were like five or six options. So this, but so this is you can see the um, spine. So the book is two hundred eight pages, so a little bigger than School Bears. So this will be folded over its spine, and then here's the back. So I like everything that they did. I think it's a really good color combo. I'm glad that they took the um, the rays of light here and they they put them out past the spine. I think on a bookshelf, this will look really cool. I was a little worried that they would end and the spine would be its own color. I mean, this to me is everything that I wanted. So I sent them back and I'm like, yep, everything looks good to go. We've got our um, quotes you know, the endorsements and a little bit about me. So I like it. I think it really looks cool. So, um, yeah, I've got a number, a box, cup, two boxes of books that will arrive in April. Um, so, yeah, it's really cool. But anyway, um, make this a little bigger. So, yeah, so there are the quotes. Obviously, there's the the book stuff, um, the different quotes. James David Dick, Dixon, T.J. Martinell, Kevin Dalton, Bacon. Here it is. Morgan Rogue, founder of Parents. Then me. I kind of get a kick out of this because right there's my bio, and someone tonight, one of my good friends, really good friends from Colorado, sent me an email, yeah, and, and he's like, "Hey, like, here's this person we both know, and like, you know, they got this position and." They did like a their bio is like two pages long, and I'm like, and I'm like, that's just not me, right? Like, here's my bio. This is this is my bio on the back of the book. Inside the book is a little bit longer. I think it's it's another paragraph, but you know, like, I don't need everybody to know everything I've ever done, every journal I've ever published, and every whatever. Just know a little bit about me. So it's a very distinct, to the point bio. Um, yeah. So it's pretty exciting. Um, so right here. Got to hit the shower in New York Outcast. I can. Thanks, Doc. Have a great night. Thanks, buddy. Thanks for uh, suggesting um, this learned behavior. And I, I, you know, appreciate that. So this was a good show. So thank you very much, New York Outcast. And then um, peace, Robert. We got to get the uh, New York Outcast some zero white oil up there in New York. Um, this is um, bacon to Jim. That's what every road and touring cyclist tells me. If I couldn't, that wouldn't have been a much harder time pedaling home on one leg. So, yeah. So I don't. I, I don't profess to be a like my friend Nikolai Razvayu was an, the Soviet national cyclist um, in Russia who's in the book, like he's a prof professional cyclist, right? I'm not at that level, but I, I am a very good distance cyclist, not as a timed Olympic cyclist, 
for me, right? That's not my thing. But as a distance cyclist, though, I, I have that down pretty well. And a ton of it came down to uh, the research of it. I bring along salt pills, like I, and then understanding electrolytes and stuff like that. Like, and um, I don't know, man, just if you ever have a chance to, to, to do it, I'm just a big biking fan. It's been a good thing for me personally. Um, so, all right. So let me do a recap and then we will uh, end our show. So our, our show title was The Braze uh, Paradox, Psychological Impact of the I-35 Bridge Collapse on Behavior. So the Braze Paradox is saying, hey, when you get things, say, like you have a road and you're like, I'm going to add another lane to this road. So then it'll be more efficient, right? Like uh, people will be able to get to their destinations faster. The Braze Paradox says, once you do that, the people who are taking these kind of side roads and stuff to get to where they go, like they'll be like, oh, I'm going to take the main road. And then they, you have more people on the main road than you anticipate it. And once then you speed traffic up on these roads, uh, people, once it gets densely, there, there's a lot of density on the road, people slow down to like 40 miles an hour. And then like the more people there are, they slow down even more. And there was, there was a study with humans versus ants. Ants, like they put, you know, food somewhere and then they would follow ants as food. Ants would go like at the same pace and then they would throw these things in like where the ants would have to narrow down to like two ants, two ants side by side. And the ants would kind of, they adjust to that. The two ants would go faster. The other ants would kind of keep their pace, but then these ants would go really fast and then they would kind of like, and people though, um, you know, it, they, they don't do this, right? So you... Everybody gets on these big roads, 405 Media or 405 <clears throat> Los Angeles, stuff like that. And you think it's going to be great. It's not. Um, so they start to shut down some of these roads and actually things go better because people start to take them different roads and more roads get used. Um, we also talked about this thing called forced learned behavior in today's show. And, you know, if people in authority tell you what to do, most, most people, most people, Milgram studies one, most people will go with it. Even if it doesn't kind of make sense to you, like they'll just go with it. Um, so that, that is something. And then this whole thing of, if you, uh, when the I-35 bridge, which was the bridge over the Mississippi collapsed in 2007, unexpectedly, and people were killed um, in, in Minneapolis. So when they built a bridge, well, then they 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 put up signs and told people, here's where to go after that and things like that. People were really hesitant to do that and things like this. But they they went, usually when people found a route around it, they stuck with that route. They didn't try to improve upon it. So that's one thing. So when something happens that you don't expect, people will try to find something to get them to their destination or their outcome. And then if they find that, they're like, this is it. I'm going to stick to this. I'm not going to... I'm not improving. Like I could spend some time, maybe cut some minutes off this. When the I-35 bridge was reopened in 2008, the city of Minneapolis, the DOT, they anticipated people would flock back to this bridge. Didn't happen. And they had more lanes. They had more, it was easier to get on and off the bridge, stuff like that. Um, people didn't come back. And then they started to interview people. And the reality is um, if you, what they found is they were looking at other bridge closures and replacements throughout the state of Minnesota and the U S stuff like that. If you tell people, Hey, like here's a major bridge, major artery, right? We have to close it down to replace it or repair. It. It's going to be out of service for a year, but here like 60 days notice signs are up. Everything people be like, that sucks. I'm not happy about it, but okay. I will learn this other route that you put down for me. And then when the bridge reopens, in about one week, everybody returns to that bridge. But after the I-35 bridge collapse, because it was unexpected, um, when the bridge opened up, only about 80% of the people returned to the bridge. It never hit this capacity, even though it didn't, they were afraid of Bray's paradox. The bridge would be overwhelmed. Like people would flood back to the bridge and it just didn't happen. And the thing was, when chaos hits people and they don't expect it, they try to find this path and then it, to get them to their destination then you just stick with it and they're unwilling to come back to this other thing because they're like ah i trusted the bridge and the bridge fell down so i'm not going to trust it 
again, or you government, right? I'm, I'm not going to trust you. So the point, the takeaway there with learned behavior is tell people ahead of time, here's what could happen. Here's what you could be in store for. And if it does, here's probably what it's going to look like and whatever. And if it happens, people tend to respond to that pretty well, whether they're young or old. And if you know it, right, to not hold back this information. An example would be, so, yeah, a loved one is dying of cancer, right? And they're in hospice. And you say, and you're not truthful with the relatives or whatever, that eight to 10 weeks, and that's probably it. Um, but if you tell people, you're going in, yeah, this is what, don't tell them, oh, you know, you're going to get, get better or whatever. I mean, it's you enjoy the time and, and things like that. And it's like eight to 10, 10 weeks, and there'll, there'll be a deterioration. And, things, and people know, they anticipate that, right? Um, so it is, it is this, and I use that quote from the Joker in the Dark Knight Rises, you know, which was really spot on psychology. You tell people, hey, you know, a truckload of soldiers are going to be blown up or whatever. Nobody panics because it's all part of the plan. Not as it's not that it's any less horrific, but people can handle horrifying news if it's in the future, if you're projecting something is going to be happening, likely happening. So it's something good personally to know. And then also use the psychology of that as saying, if things happen very suddenly in your area, counterintuitive, what's your counterintuitive thought? Like, are people going to, like where I'm at, people would rush to the interstate. So the interstate would be gridlocked. People, you wouldn't be able to get out that way. So I'd know other ways to get out of town. What might be stores that everybody's going to go to? What would be behavior? What is? What will most of the people do? Then be that 10% of, the, of not doing that, getting your self ahead of the pack and out of harm's way. And that takes a little bit to, to think about that. So, um, so let's go and finish out the chat here. So I added a rear hub to my 20 year old mountain bike with pedal assist. Cool. Yeah, that's awesome. I, um, I see a, a lot more of the, um, e-bikes out there too. To me, I'm not an e-bike guy because I just think my purpose of biking is physical, my uh, exercise, right? I, I'm not biking necessarily for the scenery. I want to bike for the scenery plus the physical workout. But yeah, rear hub motor. But I mean, I at, at some point, I'll probably be like, I'm going to go e-bike because I still like biking and I'm switch it up. So Doc's next touring season will be spent with Brando. Yeah, too many electrolytes with Brando. Andrew, Brando is what, they do crave that. <laughs> ants have better, yeah, ants, ants work really, the, the goal of the ants, right, is the benefit of the, of the ant community. The goal of humans is the benefit of the individual human. So in the studies of roads, right, we don't communicate with other drivers on what's best. We are just trying to do what's best for our own interests, where ants are trying to do what's best for the colony. But there's a, there's a lot with that. I'm actually going to pull that forward into a, um, a keynote that I'm doing that I'm going to kind of build off on the book. Again, I didn't include it in the book because it didn't really fit specifically in a section, but I am going to, you know, talk about this, this whole thing of, you know, you need, <laughs> uh, the, the, I think that study is just kind of interesting between the, the ants and the humans. So ants, damn it. They're all over the place and they got things organized. Now, this is from Bacon to Heath. Uh, personally, if I were to put an electric motor on a bike, it'd be front wheel. Can't run as much power, but I'd like advantages of all-wheel drive. Interesting. I like it. Bacon, I thought about doing both wheels because 45. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I, I'll re, I'm not against all, I'm not against electric bike. I'm, at this phase of my life, I'm not electric bike, but at some point I will probably be there. Brace hypothesis regarding old relationship, no contact is best. Ah, oh, God, yes. Do not. <laughs> uh, right. That's interesting because I would say a brace hypothesis for an old relationship would be the moment you would open up a path of lesser resistance of communication, right? Let's say that. Because right now, like the relationship is distance from time and stuff. And uh, but if, if you were to create this, the shortcut path of communication and things like that, I think, right, I could be overwhelmed and bring back a lot of things. And uh, 
right? It's a Bayes hypothesis, let's say no. That would be my philosophy on older relationships is to completely leave them <laughs> wherever they are at and do, do nothing um, into those areas whatsoever. Because as, as if you open up um, anything, I think the bad, it's bad. So, <laughs> and that overwhelms your, your shortcuts. So if that makes sense. Um, teeth, that's pretty damn fast. My thought was an electric motor up front, gas powered, trap red. Uh, you can see some of my rides on my channel. Cool, Heath. Very good. Enjoy the live. Goes that. Thank you, DJ Planix. Appreciate it. Um, Heath, are you even able to put additional pedal power at 45? Yeah, I don't know. I don't think I could add anything <laughs> if my bike was doing 45. I'd be like, you're on your own at this point. No pedal power at that speed. That's just fun. Um, didn't know. Hey, thanks, Heath. Heath's got a channel. That's awesome. So let's see here. Let me see. Heath does. I'm up over here. So Heath, um, I am about to be your uh, second subscriber here. So hit me up with a subscribe back, buddy. Um, Jim, however, if you see people as a wolf pack, uh, the Heath of the wolf is the, or the health of the wolf is the health of the pack. True. Good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's the one. So Heath's got it out there. So that's really cool. Heath, I did subscribe to you, buddy. So again, do the uh do the doc uh favor and subscribe back. So um face validity um Friday, obviously, yeah, I've already got one. <laughs> I've got one article for that, and it's this uh so I do four articles and we look at the, the headlines and analyze the words people use. Is it written by a person or is it written by staff? Because those communicate two different things. And then is it matching what we observe? And I've got a, I've got one article already lined up for that, which is absolutely, uh, we'll take this and just rip it to shreds. <laughs> but um, that's been fun. You know, we've been doing that for a few months and I've, I've gotten better at it. I think all of us working together we, we pick up things like, um, hey, yeah, thanks, uh, Robert, for some over to Heath. You can pick up things in articles that other people miss. So like face validity, it didn't just uh, do this on Fridays, but face validity, I wrote a whole chapter about it. If you have a thermometer, it reads 80 degrees and you're in a snow, snowstorm staying on ice, something's wrong. The thermometer is either broken or your senses are failing you. So you have to do things to... Uh, approach that to, to remedy that. So, um, but as you go through these titles, you can start to see words that will trip things off or things that will be missing, right? Like, so if you name somebody like, according to this researcher, that's likely to be a very high validity article. Um, we also have this thing called a low key, or if it's like the pandemic is causing increase in shoplifting. Well, a pandemic is a, a low key. Low key is a Norse God that got blamed for anything that went wrong. So, that's likely to be a very weak face validity article. If you see where it has a person who actually wrote the article, higher face validity. If it says written by staff, which you'll find on a lot of these articles, that's very low validity. That's just kind of a group of people who get assigned by an editor. Hey, like write a story about whatever. It's in the news. Um, and then we go through and we look for some keywords and are there stats? Are there numbers? Is it cited out? And uh, really pretty quick and efficiently. And the thing is, once you do this, because most people pass the headlines, we know that from research, like they'll just say, here's a headline, here's a headline, here's a headline, here's the facts. So you, if even by looking at the headline, digging a little deeper, in 60 seconds, you can get so far out ahead of people. And I'm telling you, people will notice this in you once you do this. And, um, you know, they, they will say, whoa, like you're, that's a, I didn't look at it that way, or that's a different analysis or something. You're like, yeah, but look at it. Like there's a, there isn't a, there's a staff and there's no person. So this is, this is not a very deep article or whatever. And so it's, I felt that face validity Friday has been such a great addition to what we've done and to keep doing that on Friday to police because, um, 
you pick up it's a skill you hone you get really good at it and it's it's almost instant you just kind of see things in this facility from a news headline to a article headline and stuff so i've loved that and i it will take me about two hours to, to find those four articles because i hunt around to really find and i want to make sure i'm not finding articles <laughs> that are going to uh work negatively against the algorithm of the channel um so i need to kind of stay out of that but uh but it's been fun i had a good time with that so this is um jim you can get some power up to 45 with the big front rig uh rings my legs can't keep up with crazy downhill for miles but it can only 42 30. whoa yeah that is amazing stuff good for you buddy it's time to turn in for a night night all heath i agree um good night heath and good night heath to andrew and it's also good night here for Doc, I have a um, dun, 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 dentist appointment tomorrow. Dun, dun, dun. So just a cleaning, hopefully. Um, so I need to uh, hit the hay. I actually need to restock uh, firewood for the for the night here so things don't freeze up. But everybody, appreciate it. Um, the blog post will be up tomorrow. Everything is already in the descriptions for uh, this Braze Paradox. Um, so I think it's been a good one. Uh, so I, I appreciate that. Two weeks from today, we have the Blocksmith on. There'll be more coming out on that. That's going to be a great one. Any questions, please put them down in the comments or things you want me to ask the Locksmith ahead of time. So, yeah, um, I'm willing. I, I'm not, I, I will definitely ask those. So as we do our, our exit here, please um, sub to the channel, which you've done. Uh, if you if you want to get something in your Amazon account, which is going to uh, help Doc here and just be a great thing to do, get this book, School of Airs, be an awesome thing. I'd appreciate it. Um, I know some of you have done this. And uh, otherwise, take care of yourselves. Be kind to other people. I will see you Friday morning for face validity. Friday Heath, also Heath, or a high altitude mountain plant. I know that because my ex-girlfriend's name is Heather. Did not know that high altitude plant. And with that, and Robert and Zero Weight Oil, we'll be signing out here on the safety dock. So the same way we come in is the same way that we exit. So thank you, everybody. Take care. Safety Doc Podcast with author, radio host, and nationally recognized safety expert, Dr. David Perotti. Join us each week as we discuss the best and most bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. Follow Dr. Perotti on Twitter at SafetyPhD. And remember, the truth will keep you safe.